You're on the mat. I'm on the mat. Kia ora everyone, welcome. Um, welcome to Further Faster and our Backcountry Self Rescue evening with Gideon Geerling. First up, let's start with a round of applause straight away. Gideon does a lot of things and um, one of the things he does is to come here and educate us, which is um, great. He does so much stuff in the backcountry and for the outdoor community in New Zealand and we're very lucky to have him here to, you know, tell us things to make us scared, to help us not do stupid things. Um, first off though, housekeeping. Toilet, that way, through the bear's mouth, where you made a cup of tea if you had one, and then to your right, you find the toilet. So it's basically in that corner behind um, the socks. Um, case of an emergency, emergency exit is the door that we came through. So it's unlocked, it'll be shut, but it'll be unlocked. Um, earthquake, duck cover hole. Think I've covered everything. Okay, and um, yeah, well, thank you all for coming. This is a very special night because this is our first event in a semi post COVID world, which is extremely exciting. This is the first time we've seen so many people in this room for a long time. Um, Giddy and I were just saying, the past couple of events we've had have been pretty bad. <laughs> I think everyone was, um, you know, we had to be so two metres apart. There was hardly anyone here because we wouldn't have people and, um, you know, with all the rules and stuff. So it's so great to see everyone here and be able to offer you a drink and, and welcome you to our store. Um, also, we've got Glenn here from Mountain Venture, which is really cool because he came with prizes. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming, Glenn. And I've got a whole bunch of prizes in here which we will divvy out when I feel like it throughout the night. Um, <laughs> so we'll start with one straight away. Everyone stand up. Okay. I'm not going to tell you the prize. There's some real goodies in there. There's some big ones and there's some little ones. Okay, uh, everyone, we're going to play rock, paper, scissors against me. Okay, everyone ready? Are you not going to stand up, Glenn? Oh, yeah, that'll be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, rock, paper, scissors. All right, there's a rock. Can everyone remember how to play this game? <laughs> Ask the person next year, because I can't remember either. You I'm out. You're out. I'm going to crush you with my rock. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Penny. <laughs> All right. Oh, the honesty is awesome. Yeah. 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 Okay. One more. Paper. Yeah? Okay. Paper. Oh, yeah. Oh, is it just two people standing? Ooh, you guys play each other. <laughs> well done. There you go. Plus Sportiva buff, I think. Yeah, that'll make you go fast. Okay. Well, shall we start? We can start. Great. I will um, get cosy. I had a cup of tea, where'd I put it? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me down the back? Yep. Um, I'm not going to wear a mask so I can see my face. Um, so, yeah, thanks again to uh, the guys at Mountain Adventure, uh, specifically uh, Primus, Deuta, La Sportiva, um, three very cool brands that are available through here. Hashtag push the business. Um, but, yeah, so thank you for tonight. Um, the plan for tonight um, is essentially uh, looking at uh, backcountry self-rescue and concepts around that. Um, I realised I was talking to Jules the first time. I was like, oh, how about, I don't know, whatever I called it. And I just pulled that out the top of my head. And I realised how much of a big ball of yarn I just committed to. Um, so I tried to break it down into a few uh, useful things. Uh, so a little bit about me, I've spent the last 25 years working as an outdoor professional in New Zealand and around the world. Um, I specialise in alpine, bush and rock instruction. Um, I also work as a trainer for Landstar New Zealand. Um, and I am a travelling minstrel. So I, what it means is I work for lots of different people and I have worked for lots of different people um, for many, many years, which gives me a very broad range of experience and skills to draw on. Um, 
what I'd love from you guys tonight is just to ask questions. If I say something that doesn't make sense, hit me up about it. Um, I can choose to pass on the question or um, I'll try and answer it a little bit better. Um, but it's also coming down to you guys. So that's my rough plan. And prizes for good questions. <coughs> yeah. um, but it's really up to you. So if there's something you'd like to know or talk about that's relative to the stuff we're talking about this evening, um, go nuts, chuck out some questions. What I wanted to talk about was just a little bit of pre-planning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just some fundamentals. Um, looking at New Zealand weather and just getting your head around sort of field forecasting um, because it's that whole prior preparation prevents piss poor performance which should be six p's um, that's what six p's um, and then after that I just want to have a look at some fundamentals of outdoor wilderness first aid um, some stuff around self rescue so this is a thing that's coming more and more to the forefront is um, the old through hikers and the people doing the old camelback in a g-string multi-day super fast type events um, and they're very much skating um, quite severe consequence potentially we need a lot of influence from uh, social media and stuff like that around through hiking from northern hemisphere europe where the supports are far greater than what we can provide in new zealand so i just wanted to challenge maybe some thoughts or um, give you guys some tools for your toolbox in regards to pre-planning your trips and just thinking about those consequences. So when I put on my, my Landsat hat, um, I have a pretty boring weekend and we don't have to do many call outs, which is not what we join Landsat for, but it's great when we don't have to do a call out, if you know what I mean, it's counterintuitive. Um, and then we have a quick chat just around the different types of comms options in New Zealand, specifically around New Zealand, um, rather than other stuff you can find online. And again, any question is, Welcome. So does that sound like you guys are here for the right sort of thing? Yes, everyone's happy with that as a rough dynamic plan? Brilliant. Um, so in regards to planning your trip, um, what sort of activities do you guys do? So hands up, what do you guys do? What sort of weekend things are we doing? Trail running. Trail running, brilliant. Anyone else? Hunting. Hunting. Kayaking. Kayaking, nice. Tramping, Tramping. good. Bike packing, nice. Horse riding. Horse riding. Well, cool. Might like multi day. Oh. Yep. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I was looking at the mask. You were there. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it came from that side. Um, any other activities? I picked on the, the, the three hikers and the, the multi sporters. But... Mateo's a climber. He's just cool. Yep. yep. Alpine climbing, mountaineering, yep. ski touring, all that sort of stuff. So we're coming into winter, so it's food for thought. Um, in regards to your planning, <sighs> A plan is better than no plan. Um, really, really big about the whole consequential awareness. It's like right here, right now, what's gonna kill me? Um, and how am I gonna manage that? So having a bit of a plan about where you're going, when you're going in regards to what time of day, what time of year, um, and how long you plan to go for. Um, and things to think about in regards to your, your personal risk management and your ability to process information in the field. Um, and that's what I mean about more stress uh, equals less thinking. So the more influence we have in our brain, the more we have to think about stuff, the less we can have a clear thought process about how we're going to solve the problem we've currently got. So if you can forecast a possibility, you should be able to manage it cognitively a little bit better than going, oh, crap, what do I do? Rather than, oh, yep, okay, so I can deal with this and I've got this and I've got this pre-plan and someone actually cares about me so they will come and get me eventually type thing. That's kind of important. Um, so pre-planning really, really helps with lowering your um, stress levels and managing that risk. Uh, more data, more better. Um, the more information you can have about your, your route, um, the time of year, the conditions. Um, if anyone's done it before, anyone's done it recently, that sort of stuff will really help you, as you know, um, plan a better trip. Yeah? Um, and then in regards to more data, uh, what's the hardest part of your trip? Um, what's, what's the biggest kind of either potential for problem in your evolution of a trip, or what's the hardest, uh, most dangerous aspect of what you're gonna do this weekend, this week, this day? And having a bit of a thought process about how you're gonna manage that. Uh, it could be, um, is there a river crossing? Um, is it steep terrain? Uh, what time of year it is, okay? So that could be anywhere from uh, rain, uh, snow, uh, bad visibility. 
Um, how much time have I got allocated to this little evolution and, and is it really enough time? Um, and the weather and the weather forecast. Um, does that all kind of make sense? Yeah. And it's like we all know this. How often do we go through this process uh, before we go out on a mesh? Every time. Every yeah. time. Who does it when they go for a run on the Port Hills? Yeah. Yeah, it's relative, isn't it, as to how much you actually do it. If it's a big mission, you're probably going to spend a lot more time nutting it out. Um, if you're going on a run in the Port Hills, I dare say you're probably just going to tell someone you're going for a run and won't forget your phone. might be your only plan. It's all, it's all scalable. But you need to have that plan because when you don't have a plan, um, it's when everything turns to custard because uh, you can't manage what's changed. Um, I, I found out that for some reason Jules is videoing this. Um, so I panicked and I had to make a PowerPoint because I normally would have drawn all over the whiteboards. I didn't use the whiteboard. I, it's, it's fine, but I spent all this time now. Oh. Um, and I'm not, much of a, I'm not much of a PowerPoint kind of guy. Jules, so if I, if I segue off the PowerPoint, it's, the, it's just because I don't know how to use them. Um, so if the spelling's bad, too bad, so sad, my problem. Um, planning your trip, preparation, navigation. Um, for me, the concept of it depends shows that you've had a bit of a thought process around what you're doing. Um, depending on the types of conditions, the environment, all the stuff we just previously talked about, um, what type of navigation options do you need? AKA running the Port Hills, a phone will probably do it, won't it? Yes, who's got a mapping app on their phone? Brilliant. Who knows that their mapping app works offline? That should be everyone. That's to put their hand up and say they have a mapping app. <laughs> Brilliant. That's one thing that's come up occasionally is people will download a mapping app um, and then go, oh crud, I either didn't download that map section or it doesn't work offline. So do make sure if you do have one that you can or you do pull down the maps before you go or you've got enough data on your phone Sorry, storage on your phone to put the whole map segment on there. Um, what are the drawbacks to having a phone? Battery life. Battery life. Rain. Cool. Rain on touchscreen. Yes. yes. Cold. Yep. Yeah. Cold. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We are a, a, a we're a device centric society now. Yeah. Um, so it's quite common. I see. Uh, people learning to operate in the outdoors, they're kind of around on their phone kind of chasing Pokemons on the mapping app, not really aware of their, their surroundings. So we get so drawn into our phones in everyday life, we still rely on that phone and if the phone goes dead, we kind of have this little panic moment. Um, so you need to think about, is that phone enough if the phone was going to die? So I dare say on the Port Hills, if you can see Christchurch, you can probably find your way home. Okay, but if you can't see Christchurch, you might need more than just the phone that sort of a thought process. Um, who carries a map and compass when they go on a weekend, sort of an overnight trip? Who goes, oh, I'll just take the phone. Go on, you know, it's fine. Yeah, I do, I do. Just take the husband, because he takes the map and compass. Brilliant, nice, very good. I like how you got the, boy, boy Friday just comes with you. A husband, someone's husband, someone A husband will go with you, anyone, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so what is good about a map and compass? Doesn't rely on a battery. Doesn't rely on a battery, yeah. It works in the da uh, dark, it works in the rain. Um, sun glare. Oh, oh, sun glare, that's a dangerous one, yes. Might not work with sun glare. Does it work with polar glasses? Mm -hmm. mm, see? So know your pros and cons. But maps are pretty, you know, they're, they're relatively well-proven technology, aren't they? They've been around for a little while. Um, and they consistently seem to work until one day they won't, but that's another apocalypse movie to happen. Um, along with your, your compass, a map. So who's got, uh, who prints off maps? Or who likes to collect maps? Mm. Yeah, who's going on a mission to go and buy a map? Mm. Yeah, nice. I really like that, because when you've got the little, like, you got a little printed off map, what's the drawback to a little printed off map? It's not big enough. You can walk off the edge of the map, can't you? What's the joys of having that massive map? You're stuck in the tent, you've got something to read. But you can see what's coming, can't you? So if you have that more overall view of the terrain, it really tells you a lot about maybe how big that um, catchment is for the river that you're currently sitting in. Yes? But a map and a compass are only any good if you know how to use them. Yes, it's very true. That's why you take a husband. <laughs> <laughs> he uses his own well trained. He uses his own well trained. You can borrow it. So he says. <laughs> and you, you're right. So that is the drawback to a map and compass is it does take practice or, or experience in using them. Um, 
So who's done a nav course? Who's been orienteering or who's played around with map and compass before they've been on a mission? Who can handle a heart say that they can, they can identify a bearing on a map and follow a bearing? Yeah, who, who like, were those words just weird to anyone? Good, that's fine, good. So we're sort of saying the same thing. So yeah, it does take training. Um, normally the simpler and more robust a device, the smarter you have to be to work it. Okay, um, think of a, a hand drill versus an electric drill. It's a little bit more coordination in this than there is in this. Probably the same with a phone and a compass. But compasses and maps are far more reliable. So you could be totally old school. Um, there's nothing to say you don't bring it, but have a reason why you didn't bring your map and compass when the SAR team turns up and helps find you. Okay. Um, other drawbacks with map and compass, um, they can smash. Okay. Um, who's got compass boil? Ever had compass boil in their, their compass bezel, like a little um, bubble? Yeah, cool. Most of that is actually under warranty, just by the way. Uh, so it could be a crack within the housing. And when you get pressure change from raising and lowering your attitude is when you'll get compass boil. You can sit it on a radiator, you can sit it somewhere warm and it will normally force out that bubble and you'll lose the bubble. But if you keep getting consistent bubble in your compass, take it back to wherever you bought it and they can take it back to the supplier and argue the point that it is a manufacturing problem. Unless there's a big crack in the back of your compass or it was bought from a shop that starts with K. Um, <laughs> what about GPS? You mean Kmart. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you sell compasses here? Yes. Yeah. What's the plural of a compass? Compass. It's compass, I just... <laughs> um, Is there a prize? Is there a prize for the plural of a compass? Uh, everyone knows what that is? It's a little bit old school now. GPS. GPS. Yes. What is good about something like this compared to, I don't even know where mine's gone, something like this? Is it more robust? Yep. Batteries, yes. Batteries. Yeah. Yeah. So those um, Neanderthals that like to go tramping and hunting like myself, um, we, we kind of abuse things, not by choice, but just because we do. So having a little bit more of a robust system and redundancy in your system really goes a long way. So map, compass, and a GPS, you could all carry on your phone but then if your phone breaks, you've lost everything. So spreading the love around the critical things that you need to navigate your way out of trouble is going to make a big difference. Um, if you don't have something uh, cool like this that runs on AA batteries, this is very cheap, um, sometimes you can have a watch with a GPS, which also works fine. Um, you, again, you're not kind of chasing Pokemons on a GPS, particularly with the watch ones. What are they good at doing? Altimeter. Yep. And yeah. tracking and... Yep, specific point. What I really like mine for, and it really saves the battery, is it identifies a spot point. Saying right here, right now, I am right here. Then I can translate that back to my big paper map and go, oh, okay, I was a whole valley over, or no, I'm right on track. So that's really good to just reset your brain in a stressful situation if you're doing whiteout nav, or it's nighttime nav in deep bush. Um, to get a bit of a, a hit off your, your watch is quite good. And you're not like running it all the time. So your watch will run a lot longer. Your GPS watch, if you turn off that feature and you just activate it when you need it as a reset to go, oh, I don't really know where I am. Oh, okay, now I know where I am. I can replan my trip or replan where I'm going. Um, trip notes. Does anyone take trip notes or chuck them on their phone or anything? No. Yep. No? Yeah, really. What, where can you find, uh, or you've heard of the concept of trip notes? Um, Routes, information, um, information about the river you're going to run, that sort of stuff. Where are some places that we can find that within New Zealand? Guidebooks. Guidebooks, yeah. Anywhere online? Sorry? Doc website, yep. Walton. Pardon? Walton. Do you know Walton? No. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, cool. I only run when I'm being chased, and it's like, never. Um, <laughs> so, yes. Um, but getting information from other people either smarter than you or that have been there before will help for you to kind of travel a little bit more efficiently through that terrain. Because you, then you can kind of see, you know what to expect as you get over that rise or you know what's coming around the corner when they're trying to work in as like, are we on the right bench? He's like, oh, if you follow the bench at 1,200 metres, it traverses around to a big scree slope that you can go down to the valley. You're like, ah, oh, sweet, if we're here, we're here. Rather than going, oh, I'm not quite sure. 
So trip notes, information about where you're going to go, if you can find it, is really good. The Alpine Club, New Zealand Alpine Club, does a great job of that. They put all their guidebooks online, like ClimbNZ um, is a really good, slightly antiquated website that you can look up uh, route information. Uh, Wilderness does trip. Yeah, okay, skip that one. Um, Doc does good trip stuff. So you can find it and just take notes or just put it on your phone. And a nav plan. Who's like a hardcore tramper or mountaineer that likes to do a nav plan? A white out nav plan. Yeah. Who operates on glaciated terrain? Yeah, glaciated terrain in a white out is diabolical to navigate with. You have no fixed reference points. You're in a ping pong ball. So you need some sort of a pre-plan, a navigation plan. That's that higher end of that education you're talking about using map and compass. And that's the sort of stuff that if you're going to go into terrain with higher consequence, you need to prepare yourself a little bit more in regards to what you're going to do and plan and think and learn. Um, I'm brushing over a massive topic. Um, any questions about sort of navigation options? Can you take us through a bit more about what you put in a nav plan? Yep. Uh, for me, I would put in a nav plan identifiable catchment points. So that would be, um, say, the hut I'm currently in would be um, a good point, and I would have the grid reference of that hut, mm -hmm. and that would then be identifiable on the map. Mm -hmm. So that's a little thing. If you're going to use uh, fancy technology, you want to make sure that the devices are set to the same datum or number format that the New Zealand maps are set at. The NZTM, anyone? Anyone heard of that? Transverse Mercator, yes. So New Zealand has its own very specific grid system. So you can set your GPS, you can set your watch, you can set your app to give you your fixed point with those numbers that correspond with the maps. And if not, then you're gonna be operating in latitude and longitude. And if you need to give that information, that's great if you're an aviator or if you're in SAR, but if you're Joe Public, a 24 figure grid reference is probably too much to think about. So make sure that your GPS matches what you're putting on your trip plan. Mm -hmm. So for me, catchment features, handrails. Handrails are linear features um, that you can bump into and go, okay, if I go down this spur, I'm gonna hit the river. I wanna go downstream from the river to hit the next confluence. The confluence is a catchment feature. You go, ah, that's where it comes in. So it's really obvious. And we're often so used to knowing exactly where we are, we kind of freak out if it's too vague. But I'm like, if you take that step back and go, am I on the right side of the hill? Yes. Do I know what valley I'm in? Yes. Have I got to the big other river? No. Therefore, I'm not lost. So people are like, oh, I don't know where I am. And it's just because they're thinking too micro. So if you can take that step back. So people often get carried away with their nav plans about being too, just the ad minutia and, and the micro-ness of, I can go to this point and then to this stream and this stream. It's like, no, you're just going to go down the river until you hit the big, fat, obvious catchment feature. And then depending on the technicality of the terrain, you would have to tweak that. But even on glaciated terrain, you're probably, you're bouncing between the sides of the glacier more often than not. So you might take a bearing from the hut to um, the west side of the glacier, and you might work out the distance of that by measuring it on your map. And then you can record that on your watch and see how far you've traveled. You can be really old school and count your steps, um, count rope lengths, all that sort of stuff. But if you're trying to navigate around technical terrain like that, that, so it depends on the technicality of the terrain as to how severe your nav plan is, if that helps. Any other questions? Am I, is this helpful? Is this kind of no, it's really helpful. getting a lot of this going on? Cool. Good. So if we're allowed more than one drink. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I've handed out, I don't know how useful this is for you guys. Um, just some reference bits of information. Um, so these are yours to keep, you know, help yourself. Um, and it's just some summations of some really useful field forecasting information around uh, New Zealand weather, for starters. Um, and then the other side is, is first aid stuff, we'll get to that. Um, so who's not from New Zealand originally? I'll, I'll own it, yep, I'm not either. Cool. Uh, was New Zealand weather something that you had to get used to? Yeah. Yeah. What was the biggest difference? It's crazy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> variability. Seasons. Seasons. Why is it so variable? 
Maritime Yeah, we're a wee speck in the middle of a big puddle of water. So we don't dictate to the weather like any other continent in the world. The weather dictates to us. So whereas if you're from Australia or um, North America or something, you're a big fat landmass that will tell a lot of that weather where it wants to go and how it wants to operate. Um, because you have enough, oh, terribly sorry, that's embarrassing. Um, train of thought. Uh, you're a big landmass, lots of thermal energy. You can dictate and change the weather. Whereas we just get given what comes from the West. Okay, so we have very short weather cycles too. Um, unless it's something really exciting, like we're having a pretty happy high at the moment that's going to last a good couple of days. Um, it's normally, uh, you kind of get a three and five rotation, is my um, backyard wisdom. Um, in, in summer, you're going to get sort of five good days of weather and three average. And then you flip to winter and you get about three good days and five poos days, if that makes sense. And then in the middle, you kind of balance out to about 50 50. Um, and that's kind of in my head how New Zealand over the last 25 years has started to work in my head. It's like, okay, we've got about five days of good weather-ish, but now we're going to blame global warming. It's probably not the same anymore. It was 20 years ago. But there will be cycles if you look for them. Um, things to think about in regards to New Zealand weather is you can look at the compass. You can look at where the wind or where um, the weather's coming from, and that will tell you about a lot of what to expect. And that what to expect is important in that pre-plan, isn't it? So if we know that the weather's gonna get worse, if we know that the wind's gonna increase, it's less of a surprise, it's less stress for us, it means that we can operate in the field a lot better and a lot more efficiently than going, oh, I didn't expect it to get wet. You know, it's kind of like not expecting it to get dark. It's like, it was eventually gonna get dark, so you should have known that was coming. Same principle with the weather. So if you look at this, I kind of drawn off a bit of a um, very rough, uh, New Zealand weather compass. Um, so if I jump forwards, boop, no, next one, go, there we go. Uh, north, south, west and east, yes. What's north of New Zealand? And, go higher. Equator. What's the equator known for? Hot. Hot. Yeah. So if we're getting a flow of air from above us, from the north of us, it's coming from somewhere warmer, what are we going to expect to see? Warmer weather, aren't we? On average. Cool. Um, what do we get when we start to go more westerly? It's a little bit more of a mix going on. Who's, who's familiar with a nor'wester? <laughs> what does a nor'wester look like in Christchurch? Windy. Windy. Warm, dry. Warm, dry. Yeah. What does it look like in... Uh, Castle Hill Basin, tall less range. Windy, dry, maybe a few specks of rain. What does it look like in Arthur's Pass? Real wet. And then what does it look like on the coast? Yeah, just hosing down. Okay. So what we're getting there is we're getting a warm mass of air coming from Australia, from that westerly half. It's coming over the Tasman. It's picking up lots of moisture. Okay. The minute it makes landfall, it gains altitude. Okay, as it gains attitude, just like I do, it sweats. It doesn't really sweat, it just drops its moisture. Um, and that moisture is rain. And we're going to get a lot of expansion in that air. We're going to get a lot of friction over terrain, which is going to cause it to dry out as it comes down over us towards the east. So if we're reading in a forecast that we have... And when I wrote this, actually, this is for Arthur's Pass, so that's why it, like Norwest is really warm and wet. So you might want to just scribble, which is why I gave you plenty of space and a piece of paper that on the east coast, a northwest is going to be warm, dry, and windy. It's going to be the leftovers of that really wet storm. Um, westerly flow, warm, wet, starts with W. You can just expect that a westerly flow in the Alps, in the main divide area, is going to be pretty damp. Uh, what's changing as we start to go to that southerly half? Yeah, so what's below us? Yeah, big block of ice, okay? So when we start mixing that, bit, that air from the big block of ice from the air over the wet Tasman, that's gonna start to mix. And depending on the time of year is when you're gonna start getting things like uh, more rain because it cools it down and it precipitates faster. Or if you've got a lower freezing level, you're gonna get snow, okay? Um, and then coming through to the easterly and the northeasterly. Um, it's kind of a mystery out here. I was going to put a big fat question mark with an easterly, but the consistent thing with an easterly is what? 
Sorry? Wind? Wind, yep, breeze and cloud. Okay, we've got a large amount of water over to the east, don't we, with no other thermal mass happening. So it's a more benign um, movement of wet air or damp air hitting the east coast and just raising slightly and condensing into cloud. We don't have a massive land mass like Australia to really push that air across to us. And then if you're on the east, if you're on the west coast and you have an easterly, what type of day is it? It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So you go paddling on an easterly over on the coast and you run away and you go paddle on the east coast during the north, any west end. So take this as this little weather compass is written for the centre of the main divide. Smack bang in the middle of wherever you can be. Okay, and the only things to flip on that will be your west and east uh, for what side of the coast you're going to be on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Did anyone got any questions about that? Nothing. Cool. Um, yes. I've got one. Oh dear. Is there a, I'm try, I keep studying my R dot no to know that 30 millimetres of rain in six hours, I don't want to go walking. Yes. Is there a website that I've studied moderate light and heavy rain? Is there a website to say that uh, your water bottle is going to fill up an hour if there's two millimetres an hour? Or um, What do you mean, sorry? Well, just trying to relate figures. Yes. So like it says there's going to be 13 millimetres of rain in the next six hours. Yes. How much... How much, oh, how, that, how, how much, much do I care about? How much is that when I look out the window? Oh, right. Yeah, no, like I don't, I I don't know how to equate. I like that. How quickly will my water bottle fill yeah. up? Yeah, no, but, um, the, but I've done it once. I've started with observing because I want to say, okay, I know that 1.5 is this, but so when I did the five pass, yep. 13 millimetres in six hours, we didn't want to leave the cave. It was quite scary. Yep. So I'm trying to work out, because that's quite a good thing to have a visual of how much one millimetre is now, how much two is, how much three is. Yeah, yeah okay, so you're trying to make the forecast relatable to the real world, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, for teaching stochastic, so you know that. Yeah, yeah um, okay, I would say I don't know, but I'd say the thing I would care about is more about how does that relate to the terrain I'm in? Does that, so... Oh, no one wants to be out in two millimetres. No, but you could be <laughs> out on the flats in Ellesmere oh, yeah, and be okay, okay. But if you're in a very steep valley with a massive catchment above you, you probably don't want to be playing around in the gorge. So that, to me, would be where I'd be more concerned about the numbers or how much is too much. Yeah, I just wonder if you knew of a website. No, I YouTube, don't. The YouTube that would help me because I've tried to research. I'll get back to you, Penny. I will. Yeah, I will. It's like I want to Thank say, you. you know, you go ask us past and look at how much rain do you think is falling outside, and people would, and you can say you could. You would know from your practice that that four millimeters now right. or two millimeters. Yeah, I've never really thought about it like that because I'll either think about that or I think about rain translation to snow. Yeah. So everyone understands, and I think I wrote it down on this one, didn't I? Uh, there's a little note there about how much rain equals snow. It's ten to one. How about if we found like uh, we made a sticker which had like some if we worked out the measurements, then we could like have well, a standardized project <laughs> for a one liter Nalgene yeah. bottle. What do you reckon? Double it off. See what happens. Um, oh, and you've got water, water, yeah, it's a good project, I think. Yeah. yeah, so I think the consequence of the weather and where you are, I think, would be a relevant thing to think about. Um, but what weather sites do people look at? That's another question I was going to ask. Uh, YR, everyone knows YR? YR, Windy. Yeah, Windy. Met View. Met cool. Niwa. Niwa, yep, Niwa's getting much, much better. That's good. Who looks at Met View? Uh, Met Service nowadays. Only when I'm in town. Yeah, really? Yeah. 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 And only big towns. Yes, that's right. Canterbury weather updates for smaller towns. Yeah, they've been really good on their forecasting. Yeah. 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 Um, if you want good data sets, the Norwegians are still doing an amazing job. And I don't know why, but they do. Um, you can get through Canterbury University. There's a back, I don't know, I'll try and send it to Jules. There's a website you can get access to the weather stations if you really want to geek out. But yeah, I think the ones you're saying, like um, Colourful One, uh, MetView is really good, isn't it? Going to give you an amount of what's a lot of rain and what's a little bit of rain, and that's a relative thing, but more colour, more worse. Um, YR is good. Why do we like YR? Yeah. 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 You can, can't you? You can really, and you get that really nice daily, like, I want to stay indoors at three o'clock and then I can go out at five type thing. Yeah. Um, who's used windy weather? What's good about windy? Yes, and this extrapolation uh, software is really good. You can pin drop and you can pull up comparative forecasts with that pin drop, which is really nice. 
so then you can get not just one bit you can get an average and I think with weather forecasting in New Zealand it's about a trend it's about an average don't look at the numbers you don't need to be Swiss about how many millimeters you're like that's a lot of rain that's a little bit of rain I can do this in that terrain and I can't do that in that terrain um, don't get stuck in that micro same sort of thing about the nav um, yeah so that's good I have a question. please is there a Try Newer. Newer, okay. Yeah. 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 I've been trying a couple of times to look at a forecast for like forecasting. Historical rivers, forecast. Like rivers and things. Yeah. Like, oh, there's this much rain forecast in the Canary High Country. Yeah. And normally, Just like. It's going to come up how much. Yeah. Which should be good to compare historical flow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good question. Again, I don't know. I'm kind of striking out. Yeah, okay. What was that? Brilliant. Just spam ECAN for all your weather data. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, so you can understand what you're seeing versus. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. Particularly if you've got your, your local haunts. Yeah. You want to know what's good? Yeah. yeah. You just go down to the pub and ask the old greybeards about what they reckon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's best. It's not my good. Um, a couple of other things to add to your weather toolbox. Um, who's got a fancy, fancy geeky watch? Who's got barometric altimeter or barometer on their watch? Cool. Some of them do and some of them don't. Um, I highly recommend if you're looking to purchase, um, hashtag further faster, um, get a watch that has a barometric altimeter, okay? Because that'll do two things. That will give you a barometric pressure and translate it into meters. It'll also give you a pressure um, in regards to atmosphere. So you can forecast weather with it and you can identify where you are in regards to the verticality on a map. Whereas some of the other running um, smartwatches just have a GPS altimeter doesn't give you air pressure. And if you're trying to do long-term forecasting, you're out in the field away from um, the internet, having a watch that will tell you what the air pressure is right here, right now, really makes a difference as to uh, forecasting how your day is gonna go. Um, so if you're looking to do longer trips or mountaineering trips or tramping trips where you're not just weekends, definitely look at getting a barometric altimeter. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say you can even go to dirty old eBay or AliExpress and buy a $30 barometric altimeter and they'll work great until they break. Um, but they're about like 30 bucks and they'll last you four or five trips. So if you've got a longer trip coming up and you don't want to invest in a decent quality watch, um, it's just for one epic mission that you're gonna do once in your lifetime, go and get a barometric altimeter from eBay. But otherwise, get a real one because you know they work. Um, sorry, do you have to say? Um, does any of this make sense to people? Have people understand these sort of terminologies and these sort of reference points? If I'm looking at a weather forecast, so it's still on. Uh, I'm just scrunching up my paper. So if we've got our barometric yes. giving us a pressure, yep. What would we do with that information out in the field? Yep, and that's a really, really good question. So what we're looking at is if it's a high pressure or a low pressure, is the pressure getting higher? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? Okay, in regards to that, I can be stationary and 1013 is, is mean sea level pressure, it's a neutral point. Anything above 1013 hectopascals um, is classed as a high pressure system, okay? That means that the pressure in the atmosphere is increasing, which will, in layman's terms, just make it better. Okay, it will squeeze out the cloud, it will make it clearer, it will become more stable. And if I have anything below 1013, um, it starts to become more unstable, you get more um, condensation, you get more cloud, um, more unstable conditions, in a nutshell. So if I'm sitting at the hut and my little arrow is going, oh yep, it's like this, that's great, it's still raining, but then it starts to do this, okay, I'm going to start seeing a change outside, I might start seeing a drop in the amount of precip. I might start seeing a clearance in the clouds, okay? Um, and then that means, okay, things are improving and it depends on that scale you've got on your watch. So you might have a three hour and a six hour, you might have it set to 12 hours, so it's about a trend. An increasing trend is a good thing. 
um, a decreasing decreasing trend is a bad thing. Okay, so more unstable weather, more precip, that sort of stuff. And if you're stationary, you know what your attitude is, you can work that out quite easily. Um, this is the sort of stuff, if you go into a, a, a mountaineering course or something like that, you'll spend a little bit of time geeking out on this. Um, but it's good to know why you bought that barometric altimeter in the first place. Um, so it's about being stationary and it's comparing it to that, um, that mean sea level pressure of 1013. And if I'm gonna, and it's really being very uh, simplistic about it, so I'm sorry if I'm offending any um, pilots or people that have PhDs in meteorology. Um, that's what I write, you know, more isobars, more, more wind. That's nice and simple. This is an isobaric map. Okay, who can read a topographical map? Cool, same thing, only about weather. Okay, so if I'm looking at on a topographical map, more contour lines, what am I expecting to see? Steeper. More steeper, isn't it? Yeah, so things are gonna roll downhill a lot faster. So if that's on a map, if I'm seeing, and those of you that have been New Zealanders forever, you're like, yep, I know what a weather map is because you guys are great with weather. For those of us that had to learn, um, more lines, more wind. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a, a steeper gradient between that high pressure and low pressure. Um, if I have a number down here and it's in the 9-6 mark, what is that, a high or a low, if this is a sea level pressure map? Low. It's a low, isn't it? So according to our little hymnals, which way does the low rotate? Clockwise. Clockwise. So this is a little cog spinning around, making the wind go in this direction. Yes? And this is a high, because this is what, 10, 27-ish? Okay? That's working in conjunction, like another cog working off that low. So highs and lows rotate off each other. So if you can see where the yellow happy face is, do we have any wind over Talpo right now? No. That's the yellow happy face for those of you that... <laughs> it's an old picture. We don't have any wind, do we? Um, is it a high or a low pressure? Oh. High. What would we expect to see out the window? Sunshine. Sunshine. Brilliant. Considering that the weather travels from the left of the page to the right of the page, what's going to happen with the wind? Are we going to start getting some wind maybe eventually? Yeah, what might that be? Let's just say, hypothetically, it stays in line. It won't, but let's just say it does. <laughs> cool, so we're going anti-clockwise, aren't we? So it's going to start to turn into a westerly. What could we expect from a westerly? Go back to the top of your hymnals. Potentially warm, wet. Okay, so weather is always travelling from the west to the east just because it's just the way the world spins. Um, and these guys are gonna work like little eddies in a river is another example, it's like they rotate off each other. So if you can identify with your watch, for example, that the sea level pressure right where you are now, most of them will do the math for you, then you can work out whether you're in a high or a low pressure system. Then you can start doing a bit of math about is this weather gonna get better or worse. If you then start to really geek out and you go, well, what's my wind direction? You can start going, well, if it's going that way and it's spinning that way, then I've got a high coming over me or I've got a low coming over me. And all of this about weather um, matters because then it's less stress for our brain. We can forecast the forecast. That's why it's called a forecast. How many times can I say that in a sentence? Um, that matters because it's less stress. I know what to expect. I know it's going to start to rain or I know that I'm going to get a clearance so I can push through this easy terrain and get to that area where I have need really good visibility as that clearance hits. So I don't just go, I'm not going to go anywhere. Or I can go, it's absolutely poos here. I'm going to go here this weekend. So being understand a weather map, understand what's coming is really, really critical. Takes a bit of practice, takes a bit of nutting out between friends and trial and error. But these kind of rules of thumb should stand you in good stead to at least start digesting weather maps and processing forecasts. But if you're finishing up work on a 6.30 on a Friday and you're heading out, you probably just want to get the weather forecast and make the decision then and there. Um, these are some things, oh, sorry, I can't even see the edge of the paper. These are some things that really are going to make a difference to what matters. Um, how do I make that smaller? Let's go, no, let's go that way. And that's as far as it can go. There we go. Cool. Uh, things to note on a weather forecast. Um, who knows what FAFL stands for? 
Very good. Oh, good. It's written there. Who knew? <laughs> yes, free air freezing level. Okay. So that is the point of zero. So anything above that zero point will potentially start to freeze. So if you're going to go up Mount Oxford on a trail run on a camel back in a G-string, what's the freezing level this weekend might be a useful thing to know. Should you bear an extra pair of socks? I don't know. Um, so that is something you might see written down quite regularly. Or if you go to a dock office on um, beginning of great walks or other things like that, they might have a weatherboard out the front and they might just write it as FAFL. And that is the altitude in meters that is going to be zero. Coming into winter, you can get snow roughly 200 meters below the freezing level as well. There's another thing to take into account. So if you're going to go do the three passes um, early winter, you want to look at those freezing levels and go, am I going to have start bad visibility and possibly snow on that rock? Or am I good? Those sort of things are going to make a difference. Uh, PPT, precipitation. Again, snow or rain really makes a difference as to what and how and where, doesn't it? Um, in regards to catchment and freezing level. Uh, so you're getting a lot of snow up high, you might get away with doing that river crossing on the last day before it all defrosts. Or you've had freezing level through the roof and you've just had rain at that catchment, then you're not going to be crossing that river. So you guys are going to stay on the side of the river for the whole trip or you're going to go somewhere else. Wind direction. Reference the compass. Wind speed. Why wind speed? Yep, it can lower the temperature. Um, other things as well. Um, I can't stand up. Yeah. So I find I can't stand up at 65. I can't stand up at 60k on um, cloud speed. There you go. Brilliant. For me. Yep, that's good. That's the penny scale. Yeah. <laughs> um, wind speed, if you're starting to get into winter uh, based stuff, um, anything over roughly 30 kilometers an hour is enough to start causing slab avalanche conditions. So it's about transportation of snow, movement of snow from one side to another. So if you're starting to move into winter environments, if you haven't done an avalanche course, do one. Um, but understanding what that wind and that wind speed is going to do. Um, and again, the pressure trend. Is this an increasing or a decreasing pressure forecast? You know, is it going to get more better or worse? And then you know what to expect. And you go, sweet, I'm going to try out all my rain gear and my head torch and it's going to be a mission but it's going to be fun or you're like oh crap i didn't bring my rain pants because i didn't look at the map or didn't look at the forecast okay was this your well-planned boy friday that didn't bring his rain no, pants? this isn't my husband oh okay else's husband. oh good but you brought him anyway that's good oh you want two brilliant <laughs> <laughs> that's what the choice they're just taking the piss out of the situation oh okay cool <laughs> moving you always take spare batteries with you don't you <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sure, yes, good. Focus, yes, okay, I'm with you now. <laughs> yes, you do. So, coming back to this, if this is helpful, please take it home with you. Uh, feel free to share it or do whatever. I just kind of chuck that together and hopefully that's going to help. Um, any questions about weather? It is, that was a very small, very rough coverage of something that's huge. Yes, yeah, so you're roughly, um, for every 10 metres, you lose a millibar or a hectopascal. Um, so if you know what altitude you're at on the map um, and you've got an air pressure for right then and there, you should be able to work out what is sea level pressure. And then you can start to go, ah, and now I can start working out from in a high or a low. Does that answer your question? Cool. And that's how they work as well. As that pressure drops, you gain altitude. As it increases, you decrease in altitude. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Cool. Any other weather questions? Is this, is this helpful? You guys are really animate, you know, group. It has to be me, because the last group was this bad as well. Are you saying they're not bad? They're just like, cool. Okay, but you guys are happy like, this is helpful? So any of it where we don't die. Yeah, yeah. This is helping. This is helping. Yes, yes. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Does anyone need a break? Does anyone need a... I think, I think we need a... Uh, prize. Go on, Oprah. Everyone's a prize except oh. for those that don't. Ever, oh. Well, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, well. I really like that question about the nav plan because I learned a lot more during that. So who said that question? Oh, you did. Hey, well, you win a prize. Well done. <laughs> Ladies.
this extra small running top. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Um, does anyone need a break? We're all good. Keep going. Oh. No, it's good information. Nice. Um, okay. Uh, so another hat I wear is I teach outdoor first aid wilderness medicine um, here in Australia, uh, be it to ex-defence personnel, Landsar, that sort of stuff as well. Um, I also work as an EMA frontline ambulance in South Canterbury when I have nothing else on my calendar. What's that? Um, What's that mean? Emergency management assistant or um, EMT, work oh. on the ambulance. Yep. Yep. Um, so just a couple of things around uh, what happens if it starts to go wrong. Um, so who's had a bad day out? <laughs> cool. What was not, if you know, if not to make you guys too uncomfortable, what was the key takeaway from your bad day out? Obviously you're here, you're smiling about it. <laughs> what was your learning point from that? Oh, well, that's why I'm here. I'm trying to figure out what went wrong. My stars failed the night before, but they forgot to call me to let you know the dog would <coughs> go. Um, got stuck on the top of Mount Oxford in a bit of a bad weather situation. Yep. Thought I had all the appropriate gear. The specs were really good. Um, thought I was going to die of hypothermia. Don't understand where I want, went wrong with my clothing choices. Cool. I had to sleep overnight in a tent in some snow, and I just couldn't stop shivering and peeing and shivering and peeing. And <laughs> I, put, I changed my layers of clothing. Yep. Um, I, I had the hat, the gloves, I had all the gear, and I just couldn't get warm, and I don't understand where I went wrong. I love your question. Can we unpack that a little bit more <laughs> further down the road? Is, that, is everyone happy with that? Because I think yeah. that's really good. That covers so much. She's the prize. Um, I think she wins a prize. Yeah. <laughs> often we get embarrassed to our stories. No, so it's really good that yeah. you're... Yeah. Thank you. I feel better that you're here. Yeah. Um, so, woo! <laughs> A couple of first aid fundamentals. Um, you come on any outdoor first aid course for me, pretty much the first thing we say is, you know, uh, blood goes around and around and air goes in and out. There's your first aid course done. We can go home, essentially, because that's what you're trying to do. That's what you're trying to maintain. That's what the body is doing naturally. When it's not doing that, there's something wrong. So that's your, what we would call your primary survey or your ABCs, all that sort of stuff. That is the thing you need to fix. If that stuff's not working, if the pump's not working and the air conditioner's not turned on, the rest of what you're trying to do in a first aid context is just really not going to work. Okay, so I can't say enough. If you haven't done some sort of first aid course, preferably an outdoor first aid course, which is a new concept in New Zealand, unless you're in the industry, I'd highly recommend you try and find one. Um, and I was trying to think of how and who, but I have to think a bit harder about that because it's more of an industry-based thing that we push. But outdoor first aid is a little bit different to workplace first aid. Um, and it's about how do you maintain someone until you can make it someone else's problem. Uh, whereas a lot of the workplace first aid is what do you do um, if they get a paper cut or they have a heart attack? And then you just dial and wait for the ambulance. Whereas for us, um, there's a lot of hurry up and wait potentially with an injury that we're gonna have in the back country. And that really depends on how far out we go. Um, What's the average call out? Does anyone know what the average call out time is for the Port Hills for an injury? Say you've got a busted, you've, you've rolled your ankle or you've broken your leg. Five minutes. Five minutes. Forty. 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 That's a lot more realistic. Anyone else? Two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Roughly two hours is your call out time for an injury like that that is not life threatening in regards to, you don't say the magic words like heart attack, difficulty breathing, non responsive. Okay, if you say those, the air helicopter desk will get there a little bit faster, but potentially you're going to have uh, someone come up dressed in green with the yellow bus and then get to the bottom of the road and realise they don't want to walk more than 200 metres and they'll try and drive around the other way. Yeah. Um, that's quite a common thing. Um, that's a whole... I had this discussion the other day at work. Um, <laughs> did you know there's no... Oh, should I? No, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. Sorry, I'm not trying to slag off. <laughs> My argue, there is no physical fitness requirement for anyone working at St. John's bar their initial employment physical. I had to have a physical for fire I know. <laughs> but you won't have to have one again because the union doesn't want you to. Yeah, so basically even if you're in the Port Hills, you could be there for quite a while. I, um, I had an avulsion fracture about 10 years ago, rogating on the Port Hills. Um, we couldn't get any help. We had to hobble out to the road. It was like three hours of very painfulness and a lot of 
damage later. Um, so you need to think about that. Um, I didn't die. It was extremely uncomfortable, but it wasn't overly life-threatening because I was in a terrain and environment that wasn't overly life-threatening. And if I couldn't have managed that, I probably couldn't have done anything anyway. Okay. Um, but that's me segueing. Um, your emergency issues. Okay. Think of anyone, just, just yell out some sort of injuries you might get tramping. Twisted ankle, soft tissue injury. What else? Head knock. Head knock? Yep. yep. Dislocation. Yes. A fall. Resulting in? Uh, tripping. Trip oh, no, no, no. Back. Let's go traumatic brain injury or. or, or oh, you yeah, know, head. Head, head bleeding. Head bleeding, so break. Puncture. Puncture. Burn. Dislocation. Destruction. Burns. Burn. Who said burns? You said burns, didn't you? Burn. Yeah, you've already won a prize. Um, <laughs> Poked eye, cool. Alert yes, attack. that's yep. That's further down the line, but yes. These things. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So thinking about those, thinking about the consequence of of your actions. Uh, what's the worst case scenario, and are you managing that? What can you realistically manage? Um, no one carries an, an AED tramping, so the best you can do is CPR. That doesn't take any equipment. Okay, um, the things that really slow us down tramping are brakes, sprains, um, bleeds, um, medical mysteries. So, yep, bee stings, blisters. blisters. Yep, those of us that have done multi sport events know how bad they can get. Um, think about your first aid kit. Okay, where am I going with this? Brilliant. Um, a break. What do we need to deal with a broken something? Yep, we need to immobilize the limb, don't we? Drugs. And drugs. <laughs> yep. Cool. So we can start with a split. What do you guys carry normally in your kit? Trekking pole. Trekking pole, bandage. Yep. I have carried a split. Have you? Bandage. Yeah. Trekking pole. Bone Duct tape. <laughs> duct tape. Yes. Oh, I'll, I'll okay. see your duct tape and I'll raise you some brown tape because I didn't bring any duct tape. Long sleeve uh, base layer. Yep. There was one I prepared earlier. Yep. Brilliant. Look at that. Very nice midweight prime lock. Um, cool. So immobilizing a limb, stuff we already carry. Um, whose backpack has a removable foam butt pad? Yeah. Lunch bag, lunch seat. Cool. Um, how much does that weigh? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, don't ask how much it costs because it's a brand name one. But um, closed cell foam is amazing as a splint. So from a wilderness setting, um, we're not doing rigid splints anymore unless you can really pad the crud out of a rigid splint. Um, because you can get um, pressure sores like um, necrosis of tissue just through pressure of about 20 minutes or longer. So if you were to splint someone with a stick or splint someone with a walking pole, if it's not padded out and there's a pressure point, you will start to kill the tissue around that pressure point in about 20 minutes. So imagine, you know, too bad, so sad, you broke your arm. You're sitting in ED for how long? Compared to the cardiac, compared to the pediatric issue, all that sort of stuff, and you've got your trekking pole strapped there, and you now have suddenly have the death of your tissue around that pressure point. So we try to avoid rigid splints directly on the skin. So this is where closed cell foam is amazeballs, okay? It costs very little. It's very, very versatile. I'll come back to referencing closed cell foam a lot. Um, but I can use this as a splint to help stabilize that busted limb. I've got a simple bit of cardboard stuffed in the back of that. It's good until you either start to sweat like me, um, or it's in there for so long and it just turns out to be paper mache. So you want to think about the environmental stuff and how your gear is going to re respond to that. So yes, but I think this is more better, if that makes sense. Um, so close your phone. So you can immobilize a limb with a bandage, a bit of duct tape, Bit of padding. Cool. Is that taking much? It hasn't taken much, has it? Yeah. Cool. Um, who's ever had a broken something? Did it hurt when it was like this, but it actually felt a little better when it was like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pain management of something broken is relatively straightforward. Okay? Um, you don't need much. A little bit of paracetamol also helps. Um, believe it or not, you go to ED or we pick you up in the ambulance, we're just going to give you grown-up paracetamol. Um, you're just going to get Pamol for your broken bone, unless it's really, really severe. So paracetamol works well. Yes, hello. Um, I um, saw a sixteen year old break his arm in a skate park. Yeah. And he was 
Yep. And I got a cool photo on my phone of one of those. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, no, I got a photo on my phone or something cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like in that yeah. Shape. yeah. Yeah, and that's a really, and you're like, oh, do I want to hurt them or is it going to make it worse? Things to think about is if it's a severe break like that, yes, um, if you try and put in alignment, you can cut, break and damage stuff. If you still have good color and sensation in the ends of the fingertips, you're pretty good just to leave it as it is and he's just going to have to suck it up. Um, but if there is not that sort of uh, feeling in the end of the fingertips, there's a not good color return, um, capillary reef feels like longer than two seconds all that sort of stuff, then you might want to put a bit of traction in line and then stabilize it. The remembering that the further out from your body, the less it really matters. Like these guys is pretty low issue. These guys maybe a little bit more, this a little bit more, this definitely a little bit more, this really matters. So that's kind of how the body's made. So you can scale up the things that you care about based on how far away from the main engine and computer that those things really are. So yeah, skate park, Short return on pickup, high up and wait, that's fine. But if you've got to walk out or you have to wait for potentially longer, you might want to consider once the adrenaline's dropped, all right, we're going to try and put a bit of tension in line here and just try and straighten it up. They can always say, hell no, stop, and that's okay too. But once it's stabilized and strapped up, that will really help with that pain management. Um, yeah, yeah, so, you know, if it's that, I might hold above and, I'm just kidding. no, something like that. But something with a decent bit of force, Who's you're a hunter, you know what a broken bone looks like. Yeah, yeah. have a play around next time you got a carcass and just see how much it takes to get that back in. <laughs> it's actually really, really educating. Yeah, you yeah, go, okay, yeah. that's how much tension I need to get in, and it's more than you'd think. Yeah. Um, so what about codeine in your first aid kit? So codeine is not a over-the-counter off-the-shelf medication sorry it's not an off-the-shelf medication so that means there are contraindications so if you're carrying your codeine from your last wisdom tooth or your wife's cesarean or whatever i had for years um, don't give it to other people because you don't know how it's going to affect them paracetamol ibuprofen i even wrote them down what did i write down medicines paracetamol nesaids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories ibuprofen Aspirin and antihistamines are pretty much all you need in your first aid kit. Okay, the other things are for your own personal medical problems. If you're a diabetic, if you have heart issues, that sort of thing, you might have more severe drugs. But with those drugs, you have a treatment plan. So you don't know how they're going to respond to codeine. Short answer. Aspirin only for heart attacks and not for injury. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I'm saying all of this, understanding that you're all going to either have done a first aid course or you will go and do one and understand why I'm saying this. So I was really careful not to go too nuts on the minutia, but absolutely. Um, bleeding, it's pretty straightforward. You patch it, you plug it, or you turn the tap off. Make sense? How do you turn the tap off? So who works with chainsaws? Cool. Do you have a trauma kit or a tourniquet with you? With your chainsaw, with your chainsaw kit? Yeah, cool. So consequentially, you playing around with that chainsaw, there's, there's low probability, high consequence of a pretty traumatic injury. So turning off the tap is essentially that, is putting on a tourniquet above that to stop blood flow or limit the blood flow to that area, which then you can probably then plug it and patch it. So tourniquets are back in fashion. The cool thing about trauma medicine is that we've had a few wars recently, and that's the best place where trauma medicine gets much, much, much better. Um, so trauma medicine is at kind of the peak that it's been since probably the Vietnam War in regards to what and how we treat it. So tourniquets are back in fashion for those of you that really want to get them again. You'd want a proper spur for that though, really, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, you want some bit of airtime on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, You're no, wanting airtime. It's cool. got to be Monty Python stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just hitting the roof. Um, but you've got about six hours. You can apply it and it can stay on for up to six hours. Okay, so you've got a bit of time. Did it work? Oh, we didn't, we didn't even use it properly. Yeah. Uh, so hemostatic... Uh, the I mean, I yeah. That's a really good student mentality. I like that. 
Um, <laughs> so hemostatic dressings, so it depends. Some medications will expire or break down more than expire. Um, but things like a Band-Aid, only thing that sticky doesn't work. But the reason this has a date is because the auditors and the accountants and the people that buy it need an expiration date and medical institution needs expiration dates. So something like a pad or a bandage will be fine. Um, your hemostatic dressing is essentially just crushed up uh, seashell. So I dare say that that's probably not broken down to be not useful. It's just something to help the blood coagulate. So I think you wouldn't be fine. There's an active ingredient in it. Yeah, and that you have to do a bit of research. If you've got out of date medication, do the research, speak to your GP. Um, Dr. Google if you have to. But things like bandages and like, why? Why does that need to go out of date? I don't get it, but it's just an ad minutia issue. So feel free to use your old bandages from however long, as long as they don't fall apart. Um, so that's kind of your, your plug and a leak. So in my first aid kit, um, I've got, big thing I like is uh, non-adherent dressings. Does anyone know what they are? Yeah. yeah, they're dressings that don't adhere. Who knew? Um, they're the shiny gauze, which basically is a really good interface between something that soaks up juice and the bit that's leaking. So it can be a clean pair of socks, it can be a tampon unrolled, it can be your beanie, but it just means that that's not going to stick to the wound as quickly. So you don't need to be carrying a whole lot of soaking up stuff, but if you carry a few non-adherent dressings, you have other resources in your bag that you're already carrying. So that is a thing to think about, is that how can I use the kit I've already got, then I have this massive big first aid kit that takes three people to carry for one night's trip. Um, so non-adherent dressing, that's gonna be good. Triangular bandages, they're, very, they're all, all the rage in the US. Um, you can solve many things with a triangular bandage, including it's a great soaker upper of juice, works well, helps to immobilize the limb, it's multi-purpose. Your buff, there's a couple of buffs left to go. Yeah. Just saying. Um, so that's that on, you know, stop the bleeding. Soft tinge. Uh, one thing I picked up on AliExpress and all things. Yes. I saw on Facebook are amazing. They're two sticky dressings with essentially zip ties in between. So you put them either side of the laceration. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull yeah, the zip yeah, ties yeah. until it pulls together and then put a dressing on. Cool. I've used them. They're amazing. They're so good. Cool. You can leave them on for a long time. The words AliExpress and medical <laughs> stuff kind of makes it But conceptually, they work, yes. No, no, I, I bought the proper version, and I bought the AliExpress version. There's no difference. They work exactly the same. Okay, I did say maybe they're adhesives or something, but cool. you're having a bad day if you had to try both. Yeah, yeah, they'll close it. So what's the pill? I can't remember. <laughs> Just push out a soft closing wound dressing. Gideon, can I ask a question for you about gunshot wounds? Sure. I don't care. The whole tampon, taking tampons yep. out and putting gunshot wounds is a no-no? Yep. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yep, yep. So what's a tampon designed to do? Soaks up. Soaks up, doesn't it? What does a tampon do when it soaks up? What's that going to do to the tissue? Okay, is that making that tissue better or worse? Okay, it's limiting blood flow, it's damaging, it's expanding and tearing that tissue. So you don't use tampons and gunshot wounds, no. Treat it as... Uh, a severe laceration, you plug. Um, the in, the um, entry wound is often quite benign. Um, it might just be a little spot hole. It's the exit wound that you do need to confirm and find. And that means you might have to plug that sucker. You might need to fill it with gauze or whatever to stop it. So that's where filling the hole is useful, but the tampon's still not going to do that. So no, short answer, we don't use tampons because of the way they work. Okay, you just patch it. Cool. Good question. Thank you. Uh, no questions. What's it worth? Ooh, oh, jeez. That was a brilliant question. Yeah. Because like, I hope none of us have to deal with that one ever. Sadly, it's coming up on Workplace First Aid more often. Um, How many faces are getting gun trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what season it is. <laughs> and, and who actually turns up at ED with the gunshot wound because they tripped up. Um, bleeding. Pretty much straightforward. What's the difference in the field? Can you tell me how you would know the difference between a break and a soft tissue injury? Apart from your example of that. Is it easy to identify? It's not, is it? Pain. 
pain level. Yeah, not necessarily. No. So the thing is, you can't. We don't have x-ray eyes. We can't do this in the field. So if you're not sure if it's broken or severely sprained, if it can't support weight, if it doesn't improve over time, treat it as a break. Stabilize it, immobilize it, and they obviously can't have a fun day, so let's get them home. Okay? Um, the thing I did write, and it's been a really good thing that I use in wilderness medicine, is uh, stay and play, load and go, or rest and walk out. Once the adrenaline's worn off, once you're like, okay, that blood's going round and round and air's going in and out, I got that right this time, um, then you can go, is this something that I can stay and play? Is this something like they are bleeding and I need to deal with it now? Uh, for example, is this a load and go? Like, oh, they're non-responsive, they're having difficulty breathing, I really can't do anything here, that's someone else called the Thunderbirds. Or is it like, okay, I think you just rolled your ankle, let's just have a cup of tea, strap it up and see if it's going to be okay, and can we limp to the car? You know, so you can have that thought process about how you're going to treat your injury. Don't just go to, I'm going to call the Thunderbirds. Okay, because if it's just a little sprained ankle, you're going to feel a little bit silly. But I say that with the caveat of if you feel out of your depth, don't be ashamed to ask for help. Okay, so this is the thing. If you can't deal with this or you've, you've had a bit of time to let the, the dust settle on your injury, go, okay, we can't manage this. You can always ask someone smarter than you, actually mo, someone with more spare time than you to come and give you a hand. So you have that option. Uh, medical mysteries. Uh, we talked about that sort of quickly, just things like diabetes, heart conditions, um, any medication that will either alter your mental status or you need to maintain the status quo for you is something that you'll need to take with you in your first aid kit. You also need a bit of a treatment plan around that and that's where the accountability comes into play. So if you're on some sort of medication that you need regularly and you're on a long-term trip with people and if you don't take it, it's going to be bad, you probably want to share that with your group. And if not, I would look at the accountability within your trip about how safe is that group working and communicating with each other if they can't own up to their medical issues that they need to manage. So you needn't carry codeine or anything else um, unless you are prescribed that sort of stuff or you've got drugs that are prescription drugs or over-the-counter drugs. And there needs to be a bit of a treatment plan with that. Um, the other one, environment. Someone said hypothermia. Cool. So it doesn't take much um, to manage your boo-boos and your injuries and thinking about how that interacts with the other gear that you're carrying. So I'm already carrying a way to insulate myself with a jacket. Um, if I'm on a longer trip, I might want to take a different type of stuff. Um, if I'm just running in the hills, have I got enough just to deal with a sprained ankle? It could just be a phone and call your partner and say, can you pick me up? If there's roadhead access, if you're not too far off the road, if you're in Hagley Park, you know, but if you're out the back of Oxford or if you're up in the main divide, the consequences increase because of time and exposure to that environment. Um, any questions about this before I flip the page? Where would you put burn in there? Oh, good point. Uh, you could arguably put it in environmental, but yeah, you can put burns into... And just cold water? Trauma. Depends on the severity of the burn. Yeah, um, so mild one, cold water. Call it down and keep calling it down for longer than you think. A uh, thing that have caught people out with calling down burns um, is they'll dump them in the creek, they leave them in there for half an hour, and then they suddenly start getting cold, and they have a whole other issue. Yeah. Um, so burns will depend. Really severe burns? Really severe burns. Uh, you need to get them out because you start dealing with shock issues then. Yeah. Okay, so you start with hypovolemic shock and other stuff like that. So severe, severe burns, get them out. If they can't feel that and it's dark and crusty and looks like last week's barbecue, they don't want to be there. But if it's just like you've burnt your finger on the kettle. Yeah. And it's also about where. I had a friend drop a, a, a bottle of water uh, on his foot and he couldn't tramp. And it just blistered up. It wasn't diabolical, but it just he couldn't continue on the trip, mm. which sucked. Whereas if I just got, like, burnt my finger or got it on my arm, I could probably manage that. Mm. Um, so that's where you have that whole thought process of, you know, stay and play, load and go, rest and walk out. Mm. Does that help? Um, can I ask you? I know we don't have snakes here, but what Depends on the type of snake, um, and it depends on the type of envenomation. Um, so, based on the area that you're going, I would do research as to the type of animals that you're going to encounter and what that means. 
because some will work on the lymph node system. So any sort of movement will pump that through your body. Mm -hmm. Others work on localized tissue degradation. Yeah, so um, the is still no, you put pressure bandages on, which is different. It doesn't stop the blood flow, but it does stop the lymph node movement. Um, but again, it depends. So in Australia, yes, pressure bandages, snake bandage, absolutely. Um, parts of Europe and uh, Northern Hemisphere, um, the types of bites you're going to get would actually start to eat away at the tissue and cause a big, ghastly, fleshy, stinky mess. So it's like it's part of their digestive system is to envenomate. So it's a different type of thing. So there's not a broad, but yes, we still use pressure bandages, but we don't use tourniquet. Because tourniquet applies pressure to one point, it doesn't apply pressure over the whole area to stop the moving through the lymph nodes, which is what we're trying to do with the pressure bandage rather than a tourniquet is literally just squeeze the whole thing and turn off the tap. Yeah, it would still work, arguably, if that's all you got, but I would be buying a pressure bandage, a snake bandage, if you're going to go to Australia or somewhere else. Um, yep. When you say load and go, do you mean load everything up and take them with you, or do you mean load and go as in load your shit and go get help? That's a, to me, that's called the Thunderbirds, load and go. This guy's got to get out of here. Yeah, okay. okay we, got to, we can't stay here. Does that mean we get them and we skull drag them to the car and drive to the hospital or do we ask for help because we're hours out? One thing you might notice is a lot of my stuff's wrapped in plastic. Um, good old Waddy Fuddy $50 vacuum packer. They're amazing. Um, and they're really good to make things a lot more durable. So you can put your, your bandages and stuff like that and put a hole in the wrapper of the bandage and you just suck it out. And it's really lightweight, compact um, and a lot easier to pack. So that's something, a little tip for uh, doing that. Other thing about your medications, um, you can keep them in the blister. Whose blister caps just kind of spill out through their first aid kit and like pop through and stuff like that? It's annoying, isn't it? Um, a little bit of brown tape over your blister packs, write what it is and what the dosage is, and then you can peel back that little bit of brown tape and magically it just exposes one blister at a time and it won't leak through your bag. But use a Vivid, not a pencil, and just write exactly what it was um, and the dosage and the date on there because then if you have to give this to someone you can just give it to the EMTs and go here this is what they had and they go sweet more paperwork um, another thing that's useful for those sort of stay in plays um, cleaning out wounds so a little um, 10 mil syringe is really good high pressure cleaning out um, little flaps of skin and other stuff like that it's like drinkable water we're not using saline we're not using iodine we're not using anything that's going to kill the tissue we're just flushing out the gunk and cleaning it out so a little 10 mil syringe is really good to get a good bit of pressure behind that flapper when you fall over on the trail and get the you know the ones on here yeah. mm. or the skateboarder um, do you have to clean it straight away oh. sorry Yep. If you would drink it, then by all means, put it on a wound. So we call it potable water. Because otherwise you're carrying something that's either going to freeze, leak, or get damaged in your bag and weighs more. Yep. You're already carrying drinking water or you've got access to it. I wouldn't bother with saline in a wilderness environment. Um, you have to, no, say you're going to be at the hospital in six hours. Yep. Uh, this happened to Rob, he cut his shin. I just stuck the bandage on. Should I have washed it? Did you stop the bleeding? Well, it's a shit, it didn't bleed much. It was just Good. Cut it. Was it dirty? Uh, yeah, it was against rock. Yeah, I wouldn't worry. So we just bandaged it and took it to the... That's doctor. fine. They got plenty of drugs and people to deal with it in hospital as well. But if you're there for a long period of time or like it's really dirty and it's not bleeding, I would consider cleaning it out if it's not life-threatening. Okay, so if it's that gunshot wound, I probably wouldn't be trying to flush it out. I'd be stopping the bleeding. <laughs> but if it's the flapper on my hand and it's not bleeding, I'd be trying to get rid of that gunk because it's going to help healing a lot quicker. Um, but you don't use iodine in one of No, yeah, not ideal. Only because it kills tissue. So yeah, it's going to kill the bugs, it's also going to kill the stuff that's trying to grow back. Um, so potable water, drinkable water. Um, cool, so you don't need much in your first aid kit. What's also really good is if you're on a multi-day trip with lots of people, you can carry lots of little first aid kits with their powers combined to become a big one for a big problem. Okay, so you don't need, uh, who carries the big first aid kit in the group? Yeah. Consider or reconsider having your own personal first aid kit to deal with those e injuries and everyone has that because then if you're separated, it doesn't matter. And if it's a really big problem, you're probably all going to be there so you can all throw all your toys at the problem at once. It's a lot more versatile, lightweight, practical way to carry your kit. Because uh, my multi-day first aid kit and repair kit 
fits inside my wee little hashtag city summit um, dry bag. Um, I got it cheap because it had a cool window. That's really cool. But it doesn't need to be much bigger than that, you know? Um, cool. And then there's also uh, more pain medication if you want it too, so you can always carry that <laughs> as well. <laughs> so, the little, it adds to the size of your first aid kit, but it can be quite useful, particularly in stress management. Um, it's not in function. It is. It is. It's antiseptic. That's true. Should taste good. It's for you, it's not for them. It's a waste on them. <laughs> it's like, I need to think about this right now. Let's. Uh... <coughs> okay. Um, the environmental stuff is probably the big thing. So all of that stuff you can think about. Um, we can have those injuries um, in the workplace. We can have those injuries in town. The biggest difference is... Um, that always makes me smile. Uh, the biggest difference is the environment that we're doing it in. Okay. <clears throat> so exposure to that environment is going to make our lives a lot worse. Um, so talking about different types of heat loss and how do we manage that? Um, and we can probably, we'll come to your question about cold and management of stuff with clothing in a second. I've got another slide that might bring that up. Um, so convective heat loss. Uh, give me an example of convective heat loss and don't look at the picture. <laughs> Wind, okay. We sweat, we have air flowing over something, it's convective heat loss, we will cool down pretty quick, won't we? Okay, we need to manage that. What's the easiest way to manage that when we're walking we're getting cold? We put on our wind layer, don't we? Be it our rain jacket or our windbreaker, our soft shell, whatever. Okay, um, if we're stopped and we've actually had a bad day, uh, we're potentially in shock, which means we don't have enough oxygen going to our tissue and our brain. Uh, we can't, the computer's not getting enough stuff to run properly. So it's having trouble running itself. It's having trouble running the body. We need to help the body look after itself. So if we can stop that heat loss, that's going to go a long, long way to helping the body recover and stabilize very, very quickly. So convective heat loss. Um, really, really cool things. Like who knows what a bothy bag is? B-O-T-H-Y. Who knows? Who's from the UK knows what a bothy is? Brilliant. What's a bothy? Sir? Bloody cold house. <laughs> <laughs> what is a bothy? Like in the UK, what, what is a bothy? If you're saying you're going to a bothy, what are you going to? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a little bivy hut, isn't it, really? It's like a kettle in Australia. Yeah. Remote. Yeah, a tiny little box with a little bit of shelter. So a bothy bag, this is a two-person emergency shelter that two people can quite happily, in hashtag COVID, we're not going to demonstrate it, um, but you can sit very close to someone and get out of that convective heat loss very, very quickly by carrying something like this, okay? So I would highly recommend if you are not traveling with a tent um, or you're not traveling um, to and from a hut, like you're not sort of hut-based mountaineering. Actually, no, I take that back. If you're only not traveling with a tent, then consider having some sort of emergency shelter for the group, okay? Um, these are great. They do cost, but they are worth it. They're a great place to have lunch on a rain, rainy day um, and it create a nice, warm, moist environment by stopping that wind movement. A couple of different options. Um, you've got the little, uh, what's this? Heat shield. I just pulled this off the shelf. Heat shield bag. Cool. Um, that's just obviously, it's probably like a big shiny sock that reflects light. Yeah. Um, who carries a bivy bag? Cool. Nice. Um, who's ever tried to get someone with a long bone fracture into a bivy bag? Yeah, not cool. They really don't like you. Um, so I, I go here now when I hear someone go, I've got the bivy bag in case someone gets broken. Because a bivy bag is a personal... I haven't used this one since last winter. In fun, not in anger, but I haven't used it. Um, this is a big, waterproof, breathable, windproof bag that I can sleep in or I can wrap around my sleeping bag to keep the water off. It's a waterproof rain jacket for me, okay? That's great if I'm broken, but then what about the rest of my group? So consider then the bivy bag is not a group emergency rescue tool. It is a personal management tool. If you have it's someone that is... Wife, or did you sorry? Them? No, it's, it's, it's German. Oh. <laughs> you have to say it with a German accent. <laughs> No. <laughs> oh my goodness, no, that's terrible. <laughs> um, so this is really, really compact. I've actually made this work a little bit better 
um, I just got a little bit wax lyrical on the sewing machine and I put some Velcro down the side so that I can get someone that is maybe slightly broken or myself in a little bit easier and sort of Velcro it up on the side. Um, so you can get the really, really lightweight bivy bags like this. Do make sure that they are openable. That's totally a word. Or if not, you've got some duct tape to make them closable. So we drop them off to you and you just like pick them up for us? Yeah, I'll just... <laughs> Actually, if you want gear repair, there's a group called All Season Repairs. A bunch of three women that used to work for Ferrydown bought all the old um, repair gear, mm -hmm. and they do it out of their back um, in their um, backyard. Three women in three different places around Christchurch do an amazing job. Did they do that? No. You did that. No, I wasn't going to tell them they did that. I don't want to show them. It's terrible. <laughs> but they do a brilliant job. Um, so yeah, uh, look them up. All Season Repairs. They might have all retired by now, but they did a really, really good job. They're still working. They are yeah. brilliant. Cool. Um, conductive heat loss. I sit on the cold ground and my butt gets cold. Okay. A conductive heat loss is one we often forget. As a ski patroller, I'll turn up and someone's, you know, they put their, their jackets over them and they're all rugged up, but they're still lying on the snow. So only 50% of them is sort of warm and the rest is just leaching cold. So some way to insulate themselves from the cold ground is really, really important. So again, it doesn't need to be much. If I was going on a longer, more than one day trip, I'd probably have something that was folded and maybe go from hip to shoulder. That's enough to keep my main um, heat generating area off the ground. It's super, super lightweight, compact, works in the dark, um, and when it's wet, close cell phone. Um, the drawback to having a inflatable mat is what? It can pop. So if you're going to take an inflatable mat, there's nothing wrong with using that as part of your rescue system or your patient management system. But do we have a repair kit that will patch up those things? One thing I've just discovered, you know that UV resin? Everyone seen that? Like it's liquid and you shine a little UV torch on it and it goes hard. It's really, really good at fixing like holes, pinprick holes in your um, thin rest. Or your inflatable mats, I should say. Um, yeah, I just found that out the other month. It was awesome. Um, so close cell foam is really good. So if I'm just doing a, a single day trip, that's going to be in my backpack. If I'm doing a multi-day trip, it's part of my sleeping system potentially. But I have the ability to keep the person off the ground and it has redundancy because it's not going to pop. Um, and you can combine that with more than one. Um, it's also really good to sit on for lunch as well. Uh, radiant heat. What's radiant heat? Yeah, I exist, therefore I produce heat, you know, unless I don't exist. So you're putting out heat. How do we regulate our radiant heat? More or less clothing, don't we? Yep. Cool. So let's say hypothetically someone is in shock and they're having uh, they have the inability to maintain their body temperature. Um, it's going to be a lot of effort put into that trying to maintain body temperature. If we can help hold that heat, it's really going to make a difference. So clothing systems. Um, you will lose heat five times faster if you are wet. Okay, so submergence or anyone playing on the rivers, that sort of stuff, getting the really soggy, drippy layers off will make a massive difference. Um, just damp, like walking through the wet grass damp, not too bad. But full submersion, wet, drippy, take those layers off because that will really make a big difference. Um, and then if we do all of this, um, how do we warm someone back up? Or how do we maintain status quo with that person? Add warmth. How can we add warmth? Hot drink. Hot drink? Yeah. Brilliant. I'm going to go to one more slide across. Um, yeah, um, read that. If, it, if it's mild, a um, hot bottle. If it's not, not hardcore hypothermia. That's really not going to get any better. No, you have to read out. No, I have to read out. Cuddle yeah. them. Ooh, you could cuddle them. Um, Our own body heat using, you know, somebody's injured using your body heat. Yep, okay. I'll take that and I'll add a theory to that. So um, let's say they're cold, okay, I get cold. What's my body gonna prioritize running? Engine and the computer, isn't it? Okay, so where does the blood go when I'm cold? Cool, so if I come and snuggle up to Penny and I'm cold or hypothermic, am I gonna get any of that heat? Because the blood is inside trying to control the core and the computer, isn't it? So body-to-body -body contact on someone that is cold doesn't actually work very efficiently at all. Okay, so it's not, you can't spoon with the person as an excuse when they're hypothermic now. 
You just have to be a little bit more social and discuss it first. Um, but what works best, they found after the Falklands War, they're doing a lot of um, hypothermic people. The British uh, Royal Marines took a whole lot of people to the North Sea and threw them off the back of ships and made them hypothermic, looked at all the theoretical ways to rewarm them. And they found that an enclosed environment, just respirating warm, moist air was enough to maintain, if not bring back body temperature for someone that is mildly hypothermic to moderately hypothermic. So what I'm saying by that is, hashtag bothy bag, if you guys get in with old matey and you can just have a chat, put on a brew, get in the tent, do the same, that warm, moist air that you're producing is far more efficient than snuggling up to them in that same sleeping bag with a zip that doesn't quite close and you get a cold bum. So I'd highly recommend considering that warming up a person. Um, yeah, the, the verdict's out on that. Um, again, for that same principle of external heat. So they do say if you are super cold, you can put them near the femoral arteries. Um, so put them in the groin, put them in the armpits. Can help. But the verdict's out. And the same with those hot pads. Who carries the hot pads? Yeah, cool. So they're good for your hands, they're good for your toes. They need oxygen to work, so they don't often actually work very well on your toes because mm -hmm. um, there's not enough airflow to get that to heat up. But we've had issues uh, with people using heat pads on people and the uh, AliExpress versions actually cause contact burns. Mm -hmm. So be very considerate of using those shake and bake hand warmers to try and warm someone up on direct skin contact. I would go a uh, Nalgene bottle, brand name Nalgene, 100% brand name Nalgene because they don't leak with boiling water in them, or hot water. Okay, we're not going to put boiling water. We're going to put warm water. Um, and you can put them in the armpits, you can put them in the groin. But that's not going to warm them as quickly as just breathing that warm, moist air in the tent. Get them out of that environment. The whole reason they're going downhill is because they're in a crappy environment and they can't manage themselves. Same goes for you too. You're having a crappy day and you're not getting warm. Put the tent up. Get in the body bag. Have a brew. Um, so this is a Canadian algorithm around different types of uh, heat loss. This is that whole environmental exposure stuff that we do in sort of wilderness medicine that we don't do in uh, workplace first aid. Um, so who can say they've been hypothermic before? Who was conscious? Yes? Yep. Cool. Um, did you have normal movement of your limbs and your lips? No. No, so you had impaired movement? Mm -hmm. Were you shivering? Yeah. Cool. Were you alert? Do you remember what was happening? Yeah. Cool. So you were somewhere in the mild hypothermia to just cold stress. A bit of a life allergy and mild hypothermia. Okay. Treating that, vapor barrier, insulate, isolate, uh, warm drinks. Warm drinks because I'm alert. I can feed myself. I can chew my food. I can drink. I can control my body. If I'm starting to lose the ability to control my body, do things with my big wooden hands, drink, talk, then I'm starting to get into that moderate hypothermia stage where you need to stop putting things in and start to maintain whatever heat I'm currently producing a little bit more. So most of us, when we go paddling on the river or whatever, we're hitting that mild hypothermia probably up here somewhere. We're not really actually that hypothermic. Moderate hypothermia is when we start to lose alertness, when we start to fade off. We start to lose consciousness. That's when we suddenly get to that moderate hypothermia range. Um, it depends on the person. Yep. But we start losing heat anything below 37 degree ambient air temperature, which is why we're all wearing clothes, thank goodness. Um, other things, high calorie foods and drink. Okay. Sugar's good. Your brain works on simple sugars, if anyone didn't know that. It's a great justification. So your brain will only work on simple sugars. Give your brain food to run. Um, high energy food, so it burns quickly and creates heat. Um, moderate hypothermia, you need to start treating them with a little bit more care. Okay, they need to become more of a patient than a friend that's cold. Okay, and then severe hypothermia, this is like non responsive block of wood. Oh my goodness, I should have asked for help hours ago. This happens very slowly. We lose the awareness of that cold stress to mild hypothermia quite regularly when we're operating. And some of us, if you do operate, you might be in that cold stress quite regularly over the day. Um, but it's, it, it's a very slippery slope and you increase that speed the closer you get to the back end of that mild hypothermia. And they'll just drop off very, very quick in that moderate to severe hypothermia range. So just be conscious of that and manage the problem. Okay, so we're going back to 
insulate, isolate, and minimize that heat loss. And that is what you have to deal with after you've dealt with whatever boo-boo they've currently got, depending on the severity. So the environment's the biggest thing with that wilderness stuff. Is this helpful? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, any other cool things? Oh, yeah. Close cell phone, they sell them here. Cool. Um, hashtag Nemo, another good brand. Um, cool. Oh, they also sell PLBs here. Um, any questions about um, environmental stuff? Yeah. Let's uh, say you're in a situation where you just want someone to you've sprained your ankle badly. Yep. And you can, you've got two poles you can hobble out, but you want someone to come and help carry your pack. You know, like you've just thought of the contact star or... You want it to be a full blown. What's in your pack, Penny? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're trying to risk yourself without putting a PLB, basically. Yeah, I think don't be embarrassed to ask for help. And as a SAR, um, an ex-team leader, and as a SAR member and a SAR trainer, we're like, we want to help you guys. As members of SAR, we're there to help. It actually really sucks when we have no call-outs. It's really boring. So don't be afraid to ask. We're not going to rake you over the coals. Stupid hurts. If you just like, oh, the river's up and I'm going to be late for work, you're probably going to have a chat with the constable at the end of that evolution, and they do have the right to charge you for stupidity. They won't, historically they won't, but I feel they should sometimes. But if you're out of your depth, if you can't manage that situation, that's the joy of New Zealand is that we have a search and rescue community that will happily come and help you guys out. So it doesn't matter even if you're at the end of the Oxford trailhead and you're out and you need help, you need help. Okay, so don't be ashamed to ask, is what I'm saying. If it is just carrying your pack. No, no, no. <laughs> you need another boy Friday, that's what you need. <laughs> Um, cool. Any, uh, any questions about the sort of the first aids type of stuff of, of, of self rescue and management? Brilliant. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope this is helpful. Um, it's like ten past eight. Do I, I got more if you want more? Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm really not standing on this. It's going to be a really terrible I think video. It's going to be totally fine. It can turn into a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally a face for radio. Who said that? <laughs> oh, hi, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Where's that mask? Um, so self-rescue. Um, again, talking about don't be ashamed to ask for help, but don't go out there ill-prepared, okay? Don't go out there not prepared because um, that, to me, that's just silly. Um, you can only prepare as much as you know and that's where it's okay to ask for help. But if you don't put effort into preparing for your trip, stupid hurts. I probably should have put it up there, but yeah, stupid hurts in my in my mind. Um, there's a few Landstar members here going, yep. Um, things to think about. Uh, the big one is, is clothing choices. And I put a very contentious topic of wool versus synthetic. Did you know that wool has the same drying time as cotton? Did you know the only difference is that can it maintain heat while it is wet? But once wool is wet, it will not dry based on thermal radiation unless you're really putting a lot of heat. So consider your choice of clothing. Um, consider the layering system that you have. Um, I think I talked about it last time. It's like uh, social media and the world is dictated to by Europe and North America in regards to outdoor equipment. We are more close to a European, Scottish environment. So if you're looking for information about clothing systems and what works in New Zealand in the high country or um, in the bush, look at what the Scottish and the Welsh and the British are choosing to wear. And that's a really good way. And there'll be a lot of synthetics, there'll be a lot of stuff that dries quickly and there'll be lots of little micro layers. Um, I'm not ashamed to wear merino, but I wear it as a very thin layer, very close to my body so that it heats as quickly as I can. I'm not going out and buying uh, merino mid layers because they will soak up a lot of water, get very, very heavy, and not dry, which means you just stay wet, which is not cool. Um, so think about that. Synthetics are great. Like I am a big fan, as a, a mountain professional, of Primaloft in New Zealand. Synthetic insulated jackets are great. They can go over my rain jacket. I can cook dry my rain jacket while wearing my synthetic jacket over the top, and that does not hold water. It's hydrophobic. 
Whereas if I did that with a down jacket, the down would soak up the water potentially, even if you have hydrophobic down, it can only hold so much, and you will stay wet. So those of us that get to a hut and like shake out a wet rain jacket and hang it up near the fire, hoping it will dry, if you spent X amount of dollars on a decent jacket, just wear it and it'll be dry in 20 minutes, half an hour from the body heat that you're putting out. Consider the systems and how they work. They work on temperature differential. They work on heat to cold. So the thing about Northern Hemisphere stuff is they have cold, dry environments. So a lot of theirs work really, really well because you've got wet inside to dry outside, whereas Scotland and New Zealand, we have wet inside to cold and wet outside. So we, don't, we have um, temperature differential, but we don't have pressure differential per se. In, sorry, we don't have moisture difference. Um, so synthetic insulation is a really good thing to cook your layers dry or to wear as a mid-layer rather than the cool other brands that are merino. Um, they are great for weekend trips. They are great if you're on single days. I'm not arguing that. But long-term trips, less merino, less cotton, more synthetic is more better. And you can get some really cool base layers now that are merino and synthetic, which is good. So they'll dry quick, but they don't smell. Um, so yeah, primal off, synthetic insulation is really good. Um, your little adventure. Mm -hmm. You said you went prepared. What worked well? What do you look back and go, I'm glad I brought that? The tent. Good. <laughs> I suppose a sleeping bag did provide, obviously, some kind of warmth. I did take cat gloves. I did have a full kit, a change of clothes. Yep. I had additional clothes more than I needed. Yep. I had food, water. I had everything that I needed. Yes. I got up there. I was saturated. I completely, once got the tent up, completely changed into a full set of warm clothing yeah. so that I wasn't wet any longer. I had, you know, wool socks and everything. And then I set my bedding up and got into it once I'd stabilised my body. Cool. But I just didn't get warm and it yeah. didn't matter how many layers I put on. Mm -hmm. I just froze to the bone all night and shook like hell and peed a lot. But I didn't drink the whiskey because I knew that if I was going to bring my like serenade out, oh, he's of course I did. Oh, I just sorry. Didn't leave. <laughs> Oh, this has, been my, this has been my kitchen cover for weeks. Um, okay, cool. So, so I just don't understand it. At first I thought, I run on the theory that you're supposed to have just enough layers so that you don't overdo it. Mm. But when after a couple of hours that wasn't working, I added layers and then I kept adding layers because I just didn't stop shaking yeah. and I just don't know where I went wrong okay. and why I never ever got warm. So maybe my first question today is what level of comfort were you after? Warm. Not yeah. shaking. So comfortable <laughs> like we are now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That is very hard to attain outside of our urban environment. Um, so a little bit of suffering is always to be expected. Um, but maybe the excess of layers is a problem as well. Often we, we overcook our layering system and we don't have enough for heat to transfer to big fluffy warm things or we compress them. If we have down jacket, it annoys me so much. People get a down jacket and they put their rain jacket over the top. So this lovely puffy thing that holds heat and then you squish it all down so it can't hold anything. So, you know, either wear the rain jacket and wear a fleece or don't wear the rain jacket and wear your down jacket, you know. Um, you will still be warm, but you could be warmer with the system that you've got. Um, okay, I've been in that situation where it's very cold <clears throat> and it's really bad. I always can't take a stove and I keep heating the Nalgene bottle and, that's it, and put it right next to my tent. And that's the only thing that works for me, even adventure racing, just complete, always heating that water in the Nalgene bottle. And there's nothing else that will work because mm. your body's tired and it's trying to recover. So that's I, all I can say is it really works well for me, exactly. putting that bottle yeah. next to me, next to my heart. Yeah, that's your idea as well. Yeah. So and I, I, do, I do that all night. I dare say that you probably you had a much better night with the kit you had than not having any kit. Oh yeah, Guaranteed. Sure. But then maybe it's a matter of just, whiskey, um, <laughs> and with all of this stuff, it's a matter of just going and playing with your systems in a safe environment mm. and just seeing what works and what didn't work. Well, you see you lose wet gloves. Yep. Go top quality gloves, don't skimp on them. Yep, and I think, again, it's that mentality of I'm gonna be wet, but I need to be warm and wet, mm. okay? Because we're in an environment that has a lot of moisture. It's New Zealand. So will it handle me being warm and wet and will I still have dexterity to do stuff? I'm a big fan, I love the, um, just a rain shell, like a big fancy plastic bag for your hand. You can have wet, soggy, prime 
like polypro gloves. You just put the big bag over the top of your hand and they work great. Really good for tramping and then you can scour that liner. It's a very Scottish approach. Um, but I think uh, it sounds like you did a great job and you're here to talk about it. Um, I guess so it's just a matter of just tweaking and just having a look at how much was maybe too much in the layering because you're in a sleeping bag, weren't you? Yeah. So then potentially you were stopping that heat from transferring through to the sleeping bag. So you had a cold layer just sitting over you, not actually doing anything because you had too many layers on. And that's a very nuanced thing personally to do around how much heat do you normally put out. Uh, you were tired, you were cold, so you weren't putting out a lot of heat. And um, if you put a emergency blanket under the tent net, mm -hmm. would have that provided no, it wouldn't. No so Mylar, the, the reflective blankets work great in a vacuum, as that's what they were designed for by NASA. Um, but you consider, like, if you have a frozen chicken breast and you wrap it in tin foil, it's still going to be cold. Um, same principle. So all they work well as is that insulate from the environment. They're a, um, a vapor barrier, or they're to stop that convective heat loss. They do not reflect enough heat to be measurable. There's a lot of research around that. So consider your fancy multi-sport, your camelback or G-stringers, your little tinfoil blanket is purely just a convective heat loss unit. It is not a heat retention or a heat reflection. Um, it just Why doesn't work. Why did they make them silver? Sorry? Why did they make them silver? Oh, it was from the original, from Mylar, um, from the space race, when they were looking at um, using reflective entities in a vacuum. And, and reflecting long wave radiation and stuff like that. And it just came from, oh, this reflects heat. No one ever really did any studies until about probably 10, 15 years ago. And now wilderness medicine is saying and emphasizing that it doesn't actually work that well and it's measurable. You need something to hold in, hold heat. So it's like wrapping um, a plastic, just having a plastic bag, you still lose the heat through that. Closed cell foam. Closed cell foam, yeah. So insulate, yep, yep. Something that's gonna stop that heat loss, something that's gonna hold that heat in. But the Mylar blanket will work great as a vapor barrier, as a, as a wind barrier, but not as a heat reflective unit, uh, particularly over a long period of time. Um, and there's numbers to prove that. It's gonna be better than nothing though, is the other flip side. But I think if you'd laid it over your sleeping bag, it might've worked better if it was a breezy environment, or if you were wet, wrapping yourself in that and then putting it in the sleeping bag so that you keep all the wet close to you and all the heat goes through to your dry, warm gear is another way to do it. So if you're a river trips, you can put yourself in your in your um, reflective blanket and get into your sleeping bag that's dry and you'll heat up much quicker than trying to wring out all your layers or wring out all your polypro and get soggy polypro into a sleeping bag. Mm. Um, just food for thought. Um, just enough. We don't need epic bags. We need to have a system that works. So that's trial and error. Every trip, what did I use? Did it work? Would I use it again? Do I need to give it to someone else? Or do I want to get another one? Those sorts of things. Um, because everyone's body is different. But if you understand the physics of heat loss, if you understand the environment and you learn and reflect on your trip, you'll become far more efficient and then you can justify and be those athletes like Alistair and stuff that would do a traverse of the Southern Alps in a camelback and a G-string, but know that he could pull it off because his system works really well and he's very well thought out. So it's about just having that thoughtful learning mentality. Did you have a, sorry, did you put your hand up this way? You do. Yes. No, that's a good point. So there's what did you read? Sorry, I was. No, you guys are having a chat. No, that's okay. no. So that's a very good point. Yeah, you need to feel the fire. Sorry, he wants to know what you ate. Did you eat? Did you eat? What did you eat? Well, no, actually, I didn't oh. eat because I was huddled down. Yeah, there you go. Put oh. my hat and my gloves on, and I was just huddling, really. So he didn't, yeah. So no, <laughs> no calories to, to fuel oh, the body. No, so that's a good learning point too. That's good thing about trannies. You can you can justify carrying all that junky <laughs> food that you want to carry. Um, yeah, I am doing it in a couple of bloody just, weeks. Just uh, jamming down gels. Oh. Help with that. Yeah, it's calories. Calories that burn fast. The European classic is cheese. You know, cheese is a slow burner, high energy. Um, so you get a good block of cheese before you go to bed. It's very European when you're bivying out. Um, yeah, so yeah, anything that's got a high caloric value that your body can process easily. We're not talking about your, your fancy quinoa, wholemeal, whatever. That takes a lot of energy to digest. It's, you know, dare I say, it's a cheeseburger versus a sourdough. 
if that makes sense. So yeah, the, the gels will work fine. And that can be part of your first aid kit, have a couple of gels in there because they'll last forever. They can go out of their use by date, they won't matter. Um, yeah. Uh, weather versus terrain choice. It's okay to change your plan, okay? Um, look at the weather, make a plan, look at your team, look at your resources, look at your time frame and go, actually, we can't do the three passes this weekend. How about we go and do something else, you know? It will always be that the joy of New Zealand is things are so darn close you don't you can you can go back to it it's not going anywhere um, so have a thought process have a plan B have a plan C around well if we can't go here where are we going to go and maybe put them at different points of the compass that will work with those weather forecasts if you're planning a like Easter long weekend and you're planning in whatever December have a couple of plans based on where the weather's going to end up um, time frames around rescue we said two hours, maybe a little bit closer in the Port Hills. Um, average in Castle Hill Basin is about three hours. Um, and then the main divide, how long does that take? Come back to that. Think about that. Cool. From Lizzie Fresco Button one day, and it took two days before the helicopter could get in. Yep. Yep. And those guys hate flying in the rain because it means they have to clean the machine again. Um, <laughs> A couple of things just moving on before we move back to the rescue concept. I probably should have flipped the slides, but um, here's a bit of a rundown in my mind, and you can totally disagree with me, about different types of communication technology that we can take with us, asking for help. Um, the first one, the classic one, is written. Um, so what's the disadvantage of a written intentions? Yeah, it has to run out the clock, doesn't it? So if I'm not back by midnight tonight, then start worrying. Mm -hmm. eh, there's a bit of time there. But that's how we did it 20, 30 years ago. That's fine. But we're a lot more, uh, less consumer society, less instant gratification and more, okay, I can hurry up and wait. Um, but the bonus of that is it works in any weather. <laughs> um, it doesn't have two-way communication. Um, so you need to leave a thorough where are you going to be? What's your rough time frame? And from a SAR point of view, that's really, really critical information for us initiating a search is where did you start from? Where were you intending to go? That would be the first thing is where's the car? Where's the hut they were going to? And we'll just fly in and check the hut book. Hut books is more written information. So if you're traveling through, even if you've got all the toys, we have hut books in every single hut in New Zealand. Please fill them out. Because if you write, I am going to this pass after this and I intend to go to this hut next, that gives us a much better scope of search than the 360 from that hut. So even if you're not staying there. Even if you're not staying, if you're just going for a day trip, if you're just running out Mount Herbert and go to Pack Horse, fill out the hut book, running back down. That's great. You don't turn up, it's like, oh, where'd they go? Do they go over towards Littleton or they go over towards Akaroa, you know? Um, mobile phone. Bad batteries. Um... Timely. They can be timely, can't they? If you've got reception. Um, you can bypass a whole structure of search to a point. Um, terrain. New Zealand has terrible terrain for mobile Excuse phone me, reception. How do you do that? Just run one, 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 you mean? Yeah. On your phone? Yeah, if you're not running late. What's the SOS do? When you've, it's got SOS, I see. What's that? On my iPhone, it's got emergency. I think that's just calling the local emergency. So that's just calling the one. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's just Americanized. Hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. But you can, we can ping phones, okay? Uh, whoever came through um, during the first lockdown, I came back from Australia during the first, um, I got a text message. And then I got another text message the next day just confirmed that I was in the radius of my address that I'd given them. And they told me that I was within the radius of my address that I'd given them. Um, so there's actually, for those conspiracy theorists out there, it's actually very easy to identify where you are if you have a mobile phone and we have your phone number. And that's actually really useful if you have mobile phone reception. Okay, so that's the drawback there is we have poor comms. Most providers will provide pretty good maps on their websites. Like Vodafone does a really good one about where their phone signal is good and where it isn't. Take that into account on your trip. Um, average two-way communication, if they don't answer the phone or they don't read their text messages, then you're probably not getting good comms. 
even if you say I need help but someone's at the pub and left their phone in the car who does that no one um, mobile phone in, in the weather okay doesn't like weather it doesn't like gloves doesn't like wet um, satellite a bit old school now but who knows what one of these is is satellite communicator yep so in reach spot um, ACR does one now there's a whole lot Vivi stick you can probably see a lot of those on Facebook um, or on Instagram um, so what is a satellite communicator someone explain to me how it works does anyone know please Is going to be my next point that's brilliant yeah yeah so this is really cool because you can it's two-way communication using a satellite system it's not an old antiquated um, satellite phone that you were worried about missing the satellite as it went past you can send a message out a text or an email to someone that cares about you and they can reply so you're out for a few days what's the weather forecast they can send it back to you as text characters you can also call the Thunderbirds like she said um, so works similar to a PLB. There's just more links in the chain. And subscription cost. Yes. So this is about the cheapest on an inReach. Garmin inReach is $26, $27 New Zealand per month. You can shelve your account with an inReach. You can't with some of the other brands. So if you're looking at a satellite communicator, I'm pushing inReach because that's why I chose an inReach. It's because I can shelve my account if I'm not having a busy week, uh, month and the others I couldn't. Um, so understand the limitations of the subscription that you need to have. And they will not, they used to, but they don't these days work as a PLB if your subscription is out of date. <laughs> I know. It comes down to marketing and, and money. They used to. When they first came out, it would still work as a PLB. These days they've disabled that. Um, Got to pay for it. Do they, do they work like in deep gullies? Like the old ones never used to work in deep forests. Yeah, so they work the same principle as a GPS. If you can see the sky, you get a signal, but it depends on what satellites are tracking over. So New Zealand has terrible satellite comms because we have very steep valleys. Okay, so large open swathes of terrain, we get really good satellite tracking. We can send and receive. It might take minutes or hours for a signal to go out. So you could turn this on and put it on the hut window, and I'm trying to message my wife, and it goes like 20 minutes, half an hour later. I forgot I even pressed send, and it just pings then. So there will be a delay based on terrain. So that's the limitation to any satellite device, be it GPS or satellite communicator or PLB, yeah. um, is that it's about tracking of satellites and where it sits in the sky. Um, but generally, if it the goes, PLB is going to work, or gonna work. Yes, there's just more of a link in the chain with them. Yeah. But they're all working off GPS satellites. So InReach just rents the Iridium system, yeah. as everyone else does. Um, I don't know who's renting the Russian one anymore, but yeah, but they all kind of work in that same system. Um, and you'll probably find that actually, just by the way, um, your GPS watches that used to subscribe to the, G oh, the nice. Iridium and the GLONASS system now might not work currently because we're at war with the Ukraine. Um, oh, oh. It's all right, that's not the bad. And you can, if you accidentally press to ask for help, you can turn it off before it's too late. I found that out there. Um, you know, oh crap, turn it off. And it's like, do you want to send? No, no. Um, PLB. What's good about a PLB? Yeah, no subscription is probably the big win. Battery, really good, really durable, compact, lightweight. They even come small in this now, I think. Um, one time fee. Um, they're costing, on average, probably two thirds of a satellite communicator. So they're really cheap, they're really durable, they can be serviced. Um, if you actually have to use one in anger, you can sometimes send them back to the people that you bought it from and you get a free one in replacement if they can use your story. Um, I think it's ACR and another brand that does that. Mm -hmm. that yeah. yeah, if you haven't put that on, you know, Institute Face, you can get a free one. Um, so the drawback is it's not two-way communication. It's just one, I need help at this location. It's just a signal going out, identifying your GPS mm -hmm. location. 
that's better than nothing, okay? So if you're gonna carry anything, I would recommend you consider carrying a PLB if you have guaranteed bad comms from self, okay? You can rent them, you know? If you're going on a multi-day trip and you don't wanna spend the money, you can rent them from a lot of different stores. I think Mapworld rents them as well. As a, yeah, you'll find them. Um, but these are good. Durable, lightweight, compact, relatively idiot-proof. Um, all it is that from a SAR team, we just don't know what's wrong with you. So it'll just be lights for everyone. You'll just come and visit. Um, and it could just be that you need help carrying the pack. Um, <laughs> and one thing we still have in New Zealand, which is brilliant, uh, mainly in the aspiring, but particularly the Mount Cook, Aroki National Park area, is a hut radio system. Um, Arthur's Pass has a hut radio system as well. Um, what's good about that? You can get a weather forecast. Um, so you get the forecast in Aroki Mount Cook National Park. If you're really desperate, you can probably call the dock office through the radio to get a request of forecast. Don't be ashamed of that if you're on a multi-day trip. Um, they're not often doing a lot in the dock office. You work for dock. <laughs> <laughs> not the field team, the office team. <laughs> Different. <laughs> you recorded that, didn't you? Um, <laughs> Drawback is there's a little bit of a time delay because some of those radios are only manned for certain times of the day. Um, Aroki Mount Cook is 24 hours a day. We have a, a, a full-time um, rescue team based out of Mount Cook and they have a duty officer who gets stuck with the phone and has to be within 15 minutes of the helipad for their four-day rotation, um, which in Mount Cook Village is not very exciting. Um, <laughs> sometimes the radio doesn't necessarily work, again, because of um, visibility, but the odds of it working are pretty good because they're mainly HF radios still. So Arthur's Pass stuff still works. Some of them, it can be sketchy. And I'm talking about the hut radios, not your personal radios. Personal radios are just talking to each other. We don't have the system here to talk to emergency services or anything on other radios unless you have a license. Two-way comms, yep, it depends. That's a little asterisk. Um, and if the weather's really good and you're not at the hut, you don't have a radio. So it's all based on our tradition of hut trips. Okay? But Arthur's Pass, Ardoki Mount Cook National Park, and Aspiring all have huts still in there, in radios in the huts. Sorry. Any questions about the comm side of things? Yes. Um, and that's the sat phones? Yeah. How does that differ from the in um, Sat phones are great to have a conversation. Um, the drawback of them is they're often heavier, um, the batteries are less reliable, and you can drop signal very easily. So if you're not in an area with a clear view of the sky or a thick bush, you might get half a sentence and it drops out and you have to call back. Um, and they're much more expensive. Um, so they're good if you're doing long-term expeditions and you want the ability to have a discussion with someone. If you're expedition leading and you're trying to deal with um, a major injury, you're trying to deal with logistics, conversations are faster than texting. But if it's otherwise, and the um, subscriptions are super expensive still. I think they're still like 70 cents a minute or a dollar a minute. Um, which is a lot. Yeah, um, in Rich Girl Austin's we were able to turn it off. Yeah. If you see by drone, which is a bit beacon. Yeah, yeah. Because our sat phones pull up, pull up for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's the thing about InReach is, is that you can designate, uh, you can have a designated grown up that that information goes to as well. So I can go, oh, Penny, I need help. And it also goes to RCC or Rescue Coordination Centre in Wellington. So it goes to two people, which is really, really cool. Or I can send a, I just need a pickup from this point with the inReach, which is really, really nice. So satellite communicators have really opened the door to the ability to communicate and maintain our safety within the backcountry a lot easier. Um, and it doesn't undermine our adventures because it's not like a phone, which is really cool. Um, about where you carry them. So like climbing, we have one each. And Jane Morris said if there's no response in 10 minutes from your partner, pull it. Mm. So we both carry one each round close, but just where you carry it, pretty... Some people, if they're in technical terrain or difficult terrain, will wear it like either around their neck or... I know hunt, a lot of hunters in the high country will wear them very close to their body or on their body rather than in their pack. Other people are a lot more relaxed. You go, oh, it's in the hood of my pack or it's buried at the bottom for some reason. Um, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question going back to Henry, please. Yeah. Cool. Yep. I was um, ranting, but yep. So I was... Um, That's an IT problem. 
I can't answer that, I'm sorry. But you got the message out, correct? Well, it took us a while to figure out because we, we were getting a buy set yep. and we were like, oh, this is odd. I've done that so. with our, my logistics office, my wife. I've got her <laughs> cell number <laughs> and my um, and her email yeah. as the, the preset. Yeah. yeah. So I just Did you have an answer to that? Ah. And that's and so that's coming. Email is good because it's fine because it comes on your phone anyway. <laughs> you get email. I get texts and emails on my phone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I send them to both, and that just becomes a an adminutia problem. Mm -hmm. If it's yeah. actually a severe problem, you're going to be asking for help. You're going to be pressing the big red yeah, I need yeah, yeah, button. Yeah. Yeah. So for general everyday communications, don't sweat it. It'll yeah. go through eventually. Yeah. And this is what this is kind of like. Like in regards to that flow chart of response, PLB. Press the button, it goes straight pretty much to RCC in Wellington. Yeah. And then they go to the local constabulary yeah. who is in charge of coordinating search and rescue in New Zealand. And then they call the SAR team to say, we have a SAR in this area. And then the SAR team takes over from there. Everything has to go through the, cons the, the police because that's where the money comes from to come and get you. Um, so if you have... Yes. Yes. Totally. And that's because you can't communicate what's going anyway. So they, you know, the benefit of the doubt for the PLB is great. Mm. If you go, I need a helicopter. It's like, no, nah, you go to the back of the queue and they run through all the questions as to why do you need a helicopter? And they go, oh, maybe you do need a helicopter or no, you'll be right. Um, If the, if the helicopters have the right equipment, yes, they'll pick it because it works off an aviation frequency as well. So it's the same as a downed aircraft. Uh, so it'll put up a GPS position. Um, and then if you have the um, EPIRBs, they'll put out a radio signal. And the closer you get to that signal, the stronger it becomes, which is how they can search as well. Yeah, it's the 101. Yeah. That's being phased out. It is, yes. Yeah, so Some of them still running dual, but I, don't, I think most of them are just running off GPS now, aren't they? Yeah, four yeah. or five. Yeah, so yeah, they can't hone in on an inReach, but an inReach just sends a GPS position, which is great. So you press the button, you may as well stay there. So if you're dealing with an incident and it's in the middle of the gully and the river's coming up, that's not a stay and play, that's a load and go. Get him out of the river, get him to a safe environment to deal with that injury or deal with yourself and then ask for help, okay? Mm -hmm. The difference of 15 minutes between you dealing with that massive blood loss or that CPR and asking for help doesn't really matter. Ask for the help after you've dealt with the problem, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then if you've asked, if you press for that help, we're gonna to come to that area within the vicinity. So you can move if you have to, but try and think about if you have the cognizance to do, ask for help when you're in a safe environment that you can hurry up and wait. Because the time frame, whoa, hey Oxford crew, how long is your time frame at the moment? Yeah. Yep, from PLB call that? Yep, which is brilliant. Oxford crew is really, really fast and an awesome crew because they're all really eager, but they all live very close to the local hub. Whereas some of them, because they're volunteers, they could be farmers, they could be bringing the sheep in, whatever. Um, there's a bit more time frame. Um, so be wary that if you ask for help, it's not instantaneous. And if there's a cloud or it's near meal break, the helicopter might take a little bit longer. <laughs> I'm being very facetious. Um, but it's not necessarily gonna be a helicopter either. If it's a PLB, they'll get there as efficiently as they can based on the terrain that they're looking at where it's coming from. So if we can drive to the end and just walk up the 200 metres to the corner of the track where you've broken your leg, that's easy. But if it's in the middle of the WAPS, then it's going to be a helicopter ride. So you're not guaranteed a helicopter ride. Um, so any questions about that? Cool. If you've got two PLBs, you don't probably both need to use. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> then you've got no backup. <laughs> Something really serious, then yeah, because you know, one signal 
No, if you've got someone who's... Well, you're increasing the odds of it getting through, aren't you? Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, I probably would panic and press, press everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have notes, so bottom one. You're increasing the level of response as well. Oh, well, not necessarily. Yeah, it could be a double, but we've had that, like, I know Wanaka had that the other day, they had a double call out, and one was a mistake, and one was, and it was virtually within, like, minutes of each other. Yeah. So, so it splits your resource as well, um, because you respond to two separate things, potentially, if you've got enough, you know, I don't know. You just have to distinguish the stories enough on the ACR so that they can put them both on the social media and you get two free PLDs. Ah, very true, yes. So there's decisions <laughs> to be made. Yeah. Um, so my, my emphasis on this whole thing is that we go into these environments to have a great time and things can go wrong. Um, we are living in a society where we have instant gratification and instant response. Okay, That is not the case in the outdoor world. So think about that in regards to you need to have a plan, you need to have things in place to manage the situations as best you can, knowing that there could be time frame before you get that external support. It's not an instant fix. We're used to instant fixes and instant responses here. Um, and that's in regards to what you carry and how you carry it. And scale that relative to the environment and the terrain that you operate in. Um, example, Port Hills versus Southern Alps Traverse. It's all relative, but there needs to be a thought process. You need to have a thought process as to what you carry and why you carry it, and then a reflection and maybe a reset or a tweak with what you choose to carry. Um, don't be ashamed to ask for help because that's why we have an awesome SAR ACC emergency services team in New Zealand, but please put thought into your process before you travel away because just because you're carrying a phone doesn't mean a thing. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know. And I'll just go to the uh, questions page. I fun with that one, the PowerPoint with the whole bubbly thing. Um, <laughs> I don't use PowerPoint really often. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, so um, my question is actually for everyone else. You know, earlier when people were talking, you mentioned about like the accidents. I had this feeling that there were some people here who actually really wanted to tell us what their worst accident was. I so see, I see where you're going with yeah, this. Yeah, I yes. know we said pictures though, because that's the best bit. <laughs> <laughs> More pictures of bloody exploits. Oh, if anyone's interested, Instagram, savage paramedics. <laughs> <laughs> trauma Tuesdays and Trauma Thursdays. <laughs> it's brilliant. You have to confirm your age sometimes, it's really interesting. <laughs> Um, if anyone wants trauma, um, sure. Like, I think, I think, I think, I think someone's angling for a, give us your story and we'll see if you get something. Yeah, yeah. Did anyone, you know, tell us what happened, but tell us what the learning was from that. If anyone had something they want to share, please. So earlier this year, it's not actually bush, but it was not managed well. Doesn't have to be. Yeah. Thanks, sorry. Drag on too long. <laughs> my husband went over his bar and completely ruptured his AC joint. His bone was, you know, kind of poking out and covered in blood for the rest of it. Um, and the park space was safe. able to do anything. See you next week. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted by people walking past me. What didn't happen? <laughs> Yep. And left him, and he was a, you know, he was a right mess. Yep. Um, but they'd left my son on the side of the mountain. Oh, by themselves. Oh, jeez. Okay. So even though I said to my son, if they're in there, they look after him. Um, and so I've been reflecting on that as to whether or not I would have actually been better to phone 111 at that point. Because I was thinking that actually they would have, because he never got checked his back for a concussion or anything. Did he go to the doctor afterwards? Did he get a ref so there was no response, no medical response to him while at the adventure park, is what you're saying? Yeah. They right. Didn't, they didn't even find out his name, age, medical conditions, nothing. Mm. So your basic, first aid course at work, you know, that everybody gets at their workplace. Yep. That wasn't going to at all. So what was your learning from that? Well, <laughs> my learning, well, I suppose what I've, I don't actually 
actually no, because I still don't know whether I've prompted him the right way in calling the park rather than 111. Yeah, I think 111 might have got you a faster response mm -hmm. or maybe the response you were wanting. Yeah. Um, but if you're still, if that's not sitting well with you, I would just try and make an appointment with the ops manager and ask what mm. happened. Oh, I've, I've complained massively. Yeah, no, not just complaint, but also a constructive discussion with the ops manager and go, this is my experience. Yeah. Why did that happen? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. okay. They, they that's great. Did, they did conduct things. Okay, cool. I, I can't answer to them, but yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's a good, yeah. I'll probably maybe call one on one. Yep, that's fine. Um, or get your son to call. Because he's right then and there and he can talk them through if he had that. So you can say, look, just call triple one. Yeah. They're not grumpy people. They're really nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Any other things and learnings? I just like to see me doing bridge to bridge mountain bike race. Right. That's you horrific. Just I don't know if there's any learning to that. <laughs> Pissed out radium, freezing cold. Um, all right. a lot of hot chocolate to warm me up. Oh, good. So I guess thank you very much for coming this evening. Hopefully it's been helpful. Sorry, question quick before everyone's leaving. Here you go. Yeah. Um, Horizons Unlimited does them. There's not many others. Um, if you get enough people together, the Alpine Club will run them. I can get them run through the Alpine Club. I can run them through the Alpine Club as well. Um, but there's enough people. But Horizons Unlimited is probably the only, and Peak Safety are the two suppliers within the public realm that you could probably reach out to. Backcountry Avalanche Courses? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked. So, um, <laughs> the New Zealand Snow Safety Institute, ran out of Temple Basin Ski Field, has been uh, around for 45 years, one of the oldest mountaineering schools in the country. Uh, we just revamped it five years ago. We are now um, Adventure Activity Certified, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, and we run four and five day backcountry avalanche courses based up on the hill with a bar and a chef and a lecture room and free skiing. And we also do foot based courses as well. So if you're a, a plonker or a snowshoer, um, you can do a, a foot based backcountry avalanche course or an avalanche awareness course as well. Um, they also do mountaineering courses. Um, Ski mountaineering courses. There's a whole list. Um, just take the QR code as you walk out. Brilliant. Thanks for asking. Um, so yeah, I was just going to wrap it up with thank you very much for coming. Hopefully it's been helpful. Um, and if there's anything that you disagree with or you want to talk about, uh, feel free to chuck me an email. Um, hit me up. Um, I'm always happy to be fallible. So yeah, thank you for your time. I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, yeah. I just say thank, thank you, everyone. We very much. Um, <laughs> Landstar tonight while you guys oh, all coming along. So thank you so much. That's it's awesome. great. Um, we have another event in a couple of weeks with Gideon. It's on the website if you're interested. And um, I've got uh, this great prize here, some really cool jacket for you out there. The one who reminded us that we need to eat food. Yes. This is <laughs> yeah. Well done. Brilliant. Thank you. Drive safe. <laughs> what else is in here? I've got two more. Thank you. No, cheers. What's that in? Yeah, cheers. What am I? Oh, cheers, mate. See you later. It's a very little Thank person. you so much. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I remember a while ago. Yeah, it's good. 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 It's yeah, he's the one. So Cobbler Glen, he has a brilliant job. Yeah. And what's, what's he doing on this brain? The ultimate of